started. I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome everyone to this Physics of Life um, conference, which is called Physics of Emergent Behavior 3, from Origin of Life to Multicellularity. My name is Robert Endres, and I'm one of the organizers, and along with Chu Fan Li and Elaine de Malipart and Sarah Walker, uh, we wanted to welcome you to this event. So um, there has been quite a, a tremendous uh, interest in this uh, conference. Over 700, almost 800 people signed up. And also virtual, we hope that we can have it um, at an in, at a interactive, um, in an interactive way, we can run it. So before we start, I wanted to thank all the speakers for making time. And you know, the time zones were uh, quite an issue in the beginning, but we figured that out. I also wanted to thank the Imperial event team for the logistics and the support for running the workshop and also Suhail Islam for um, setting up the registration website. And then uh, additionally, the Imperial uh, College uh, uh, Network of Excellence Initiative, which we are part of um, as part of the Physics of Life and IOP's Institute of Physics for support. Um, coming back to the science, so uh, the topic of origin of life and multicellularity is really a profound topic, I think, uh, quite a deep question. And um, to uh, make this accessible to a broad audience, we gave the speakers a provocative assignment to talk about the, the big open questions and where the field might be heading and less so about the technical details. Uh, of course, one issue is that the origin of life uh, is not such a well-defined uh, well-defined problem so um, to uh, and so a lot of people from different backgrounds work on this so to introduce this topic a bit more I prepared a couple of slides which I'm going to share now I uh, hope you can see that so this is just again the program you saw it already we have these two days of exciting uh, events. So we have uh, four, four sessions. We will talk about this in more detail in a second. Some of you might also wonder why Physics of Emergence 3. So there were these two earlier conferences, which dated a couple years back already. Um, so obvious issue was we wanted to have big open questions to be addressed uh, about uh, collective behavior originally. And then later on, we, we spanned molecules to planets. So it was even, even bigger in terms of, of scales. Um, the conference originally was initiated by the Physics of Life Network uh, at Imperial College. Um, just uh, here's briefly the website. Um, besides some conferences, we also run a, a monthly seminar series which are recorded, so, so please check it out if you like. So how do you now introduce the uh, origin of life to a, to a broad audience? And I'm sure not everyone thinks about this problem all the time, me included. So, Obviously, this has been an event a long time ago, 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. So here I just wanted to show this uh, phylogenetic tree, the so-called tree of life is the different domains of life. And the point is now, if you would go back in time uh, down the phylogenetic tree and look what is conserved, you end up with the last universal common ancestor, Luca. And of course, the issue here is that, um, that this is already quite a modern biological organism following Darwinian evolution. So, um, and so with that high complexity, we run into that classical chicken and egg problem. So however, we can go further back in time and ultimately we will end up with uh, chemistry, maybe complex chemistry and even ultimately physics. And somewhere there uh, at this moment, we had this transition from non-living to living matter, which we then call the origin of life. Um, of course, now how to introduce this in a couple of minutes this is very difficult. So I just uh, wanted to say there's these two, potentially two branches, how to think about it. I won't call it, I won't, I called one of them the biochemical perspective. I'm not going to read all these keywords, but some of these might sound familiar to you and might uh, pop back some memories about what you know already um, for the audience. Certainly you probably have heard about the RNA world and the famous Miller and Urey experiment. And then there's the other community, the physics community would say, um, okay, physics of life, uh, uh, origin of life is really a physics problem. And of course, there has been famous work by Evan Schrödinger in the lecture and book. And in the more modern time, we have the stochastic thermodynamics, which addresses this as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I come from a um, biological physics background and, uh, you know, there are a lot of physical principles now being investigated. I would say they're also important for understanding the origin of life, but this is a very personal view. So I just wanted to briefly highlight a couple of them again to 
to, to so we can start thinking about this. Um, but other people might have a very different um, angle on this. So, so one thing is certainly um, one important constraint is certainly the second law of thermodynamics that in a closed system the entropy will increase unless at equilibrium it's zero, and um, and so that provides a severe constraint on the origin of life where we create order. However, uh, more recently, the other ways to think about this entropy increase, so we can write it for a sequence of events or paths. And so if there's a macroscopic event very likely, like the cup breaking, for instance, there's a large increase in entropy, and the other events, the reversal event would not happen. Um, but however, when we go to smaller scales, we can have a spontaneous creation of order and, and violation in certain instances. Um, of course, biological systems also adapt over evolutionary time scales, um, but we can also think of this in terms of function of, of, um, of, um, of organisms. So here's just an example from a paper of Pablo. He's one of the speakers from a, years, from a few years back, which is about bacterial chemotaxis, and it's about this adaptation mechanism where some methylation level of receptors track some external ligand concentration. Don't worry about the details. The point is at equilibrium, everything goes down in energy, it doesn't really produce anything so useful. However, when we drive the whole system with energy consumption, we can be at the sweet spot where we get precise and robust adaptation for free and even engineering principles like uh, integral feedback control. Um, another thing, of course, is about accuracy and precision and uh, potentially error correction. So there's this classic Hopfield kinetic proofreading model. In equilibrium, uh, separation of different um, discrimination of different substrates is very difficult determined by Boltzmann distribution. However, when we run this uh, non-equilibrium where we have driven pathways, um, we can become more accurate. One last thing, if we think of biology, of course, we would think in ex eventually that uh, we will have um, uh, um, intelligence developing or evolving. Of course, we could, we could think about this in terms of complicated neuroscience. Here, I just wanted to take a, on a perspective of Wissen and Gross. Um, from a few years back, um, thinking about it in terms of physics. So we could, as an alien race, look down on the Earth and, and see meteorites, uh, asteroids uh, hitting the Earth. Sorry. Uh, we see asteroids hitting the Earth, but then billions of years later, we might uh, start seeing that um, asteroids are being deflected. And so we could infer that the planet has evolved some uh, awareness or intelligence. And um, and this wouldn't require necessarily any biology um, to understand this. So it's just a different way of, of looking at this thing. OK, um, just last but not least, um, just a couple of questions also to, to get people thinking about this problem. And again, it's a, a personal choice, but these are, I think, quite common uh, questions. The first one might be, you know, how complexity arises in biology. Uh, we would not argue that this is biological organisms are complex. At the same time, at a higher level, we have all the simplicity and order and regularity in biology. So that seems like a paradox. Um, uh, second, um, we could ask, uh, similar to Evan Schrödinger, are there new physical laws we might be missing to explain the emergence of life? Um, maybe not at a fundamental level, but at an emergent level. Even if we would say no, uh, then we might still wonder about physical principles which might be relevant to the origin of life. And finally, in the tradition of theoretical uh, physics, we might want to end up with a predictive quantitative theory. And so given certain conditions, can we predict um, if life is evolving, um, essentially a probability of life we could um, try to calculate. And in particular, in terms of Earth, we, would want, we might want to know, was life uh, in, inevitable or is it um, a very rare event and very unlikely? OK, so. So that brings me now uh, to the first session, which is life and molecules. And, um, and there are three speakers. Um, and we wanted, I wanted to introduce them briefly all together. So, so there's essentially a block of speakers. And then uh, each speaker has 20 minutes, 15 plus 5, 5 minutes for, for a quick question answer session. But then we have the joint panel discussion of all the speakers and the organizing committee to have a more um, interactive um, thing. Uh, uh, attendees can submit questions on the Q&A and we can uh, then also address some of these and transfer them to the audience, uh, to the speakers. So, um, so originally 
Okay, so three, three speakers are Dieter Brown. However, we don't start with Dieter now, we start with Joanna because of some uh, technical issues. Nevertheless, Dieter Brown is from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and uh, he uses experiments and simulation to address uh, the onset of Darwinian evolution in a non equilibrium environment. Um, then we have Joanna from, uh, she just started, Joanna uh, Xavier, she just started uh, University College London. And uh, she will talk about autocolytic sets, which are uh, um, self-contained uh, networks where all molecules are catalyzed by, by other molecules. And that will be very interesting. It's more about the collective behavior. And then we have Sarah Walker. She's also one of the organizers. She's from Arizona State University. And uh, yeah, I mean, she has a, 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 a theoretical physics background and works in astrobiology. And she, I think she has a very good overview of this field. And so that will be also very exciting to hear her opinion. Um, so now uh, we start and uh, we make a small change that we start with uh, Joanna. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers very much. This is a very exciting meeting. I'm very glad to be part. And in the spirit of thanks, I will move towards my acknowledgement slide. A bit heretic, but uh, let me do that because I just started uh, a new position in UCL. I'm very happy about it, so I want to thank uh, all my funders and the other institutions and all my great collaborators, but uh, uh, in particularly the, the Lane Origins Lab at UCL. And uh, I want to mention as well, and thank very much Olin, the Origin of Life Early Career Network, um, <coughs> which I've, I'm an active part. And um, it keeps reminding me that uh, the Origin of Life is a question that is definitely not uh, a one person's uh, task only. So I was very excited with this meeting uh, in particular because it uh, talks about emergence, uh, which is uh, a different word than origins that we are more used to, to hear. But also I like this image very much that was used uh, because when you look at it at first, it could seem like a phylogenetic tree or even a cross section of a brain. <laughs> but in fact, it is um, a colony of bacteria that engage in social behavior and form these complex structures um, that, that emerge from uh, a single cell. So quite interesting uh, for us here. So emergence uh, is a very hot topic. Uh, it belongs more in the philosophy of science, but I think we should all be aware, uh, especially if we study origins, of the implications of, of the philosophy of emergence. And biology loves emergence, um, mostly because we can uh, model and predict uh, properties, biological properties, without knowing all the very basal uh, quantum level properties of the atoms that make biological systems. Um, so there, there are other uh, possible suggestions towards strong emergence, but I think most of us right now agree that weak emergence is, is real and useful. Um, so the, the emergence is about the, the, the arising of unexpected or non-deducible properties uh, in, in systems, and Kaufman sometimes talks about these as unprestatable as well. Uh, a very basal example of emergence uh, is um, the, the origin of uh, unique catalysis mechanisms in biochemistry. So I do not see a way that these could be foreseen. I if they could, it would be in fact a holy grail for chemioinformatics. Um, we shall see how the field advances. In terms of life, many people talk about emergence as uh, int the interesting emergence of order and information. Um, I hope the Natural History Museum does not mind me sharing this photograph that I took there last week uh, here in London because I could not find a 
better image of uh, uh, the order, the complex order that is in a, a, a simple crystal. So order exists uh, outside of life uh, and before life. And you can see that in the Natural History Museum. So go there <laughs> and uh, you can you can see the the complex structures that crystal can form and that at first glance they they are very similar to protein structures even so origins of life imply more than origins of order uh, there in life you have energy and matter metabolism self replication then plated replication code and cells uh, which um, at the beginning of life would were not probably fully fledged, we're not for sure, but uh, some kind of proto entity. Um, I think the big question here is how we can get variation and selection before we have the genetic code. And this complex interplay between geochemistry and biochemistry is what I'm most interested at uh, the emergence of uh, these phenomena. So you can choose to focus on different aspects of life, uh, but uh, none of these alone make up what a living system is. And um, this transition here, I think it's the, the big black hole. And in part, it's because of the self-referentiality of the genetic code. And so this is where we are working right now. So I said I would be talking about universal biomolecules, and I, I would like to start by that. So if you look at what I just said, um, the processes that make up a cell are very complex. So I, as a bioengineer, I thought I would be going for the parts and try to decipher their uh, interactions. So the, I think it, it's good for anyone that studies the origin of life to have a visual perspective of what makes up life and what are the parts and the pdb is a great source for a scale view of what makes up a cell um, there are many uh, essential components for all the simplest cells that we know um, i gave them some funny names here uh, and here outside you have uh, a virus but i'm i'm focusing more in my work on very small things much less complex than this but which are implied in the arrangement of the system and the way it functions and hopefully i believe its emergence so one of the things i did some years ago was to integrate a lot of metabolic data and simulation of metabolic models to infer which of these molecules very small molecules are essential in in the functioning of cells so this is just a very broad schematic of this work. It was basically data integration from different sources, experimental sources of essentiality and genome scale metabolic models and literature, which led me to infer uh, which organic factors should be uh, present in genome scale metabolic models. So this is a, a list which was integrated very recently into community standards and um, I'm very happy about that. And this means that um, for the actual uh, functioning of metabolic modeling and to predict the behavior, growth, uh, and metabolism of a cell, you need to include these molecules uh, for the model to function. I usually focus on pyridoxal 5-phosphate as one of my favorites. It's a uh, also called the Swiss Army knife of catalysis, but today I want to uh, focus a bit more and tell you more about NAD uh, because it has come up later in my work from a very different approach. Um, and NAD is super interesting because it's basically two nucleosides drawn by pyrophosphate and it, it allows for a universal reaction in all cells as we know them. Uh, it's a universal redox currency. But also in the structure of NAD, you have ADP embedded, so this part of the molecule. And uh, what gets uh, reduced or oxidized is just this part, which you see here. So ATP is basically NAD with one more phosphate and without the second ribose, which is quite interesting and tells you about uh, how uh, the biochemistry has constraints that are very specific 
and very fundamental for all cells as we know them. And we'll see the relevance of this later in autocatalysis work. So regarding autocatalysis, um, we all know that life is self-referential and uh, Pasteur took a big leap when uh, he told us that all life comes from life, but we also know that at some point uh, life had to emerge in the universe. Um, so in, in cells, cells catalyze their own um, reproduction through the production of all the essential components and also the maintenance, maintenance of the energetic requirements. Uh, but in its simplest form that we can conceive, uh, self-referentiality in chemistry is uh, an autocatalytic reaction where basically one compound enhances the rate of its own production. And uh, more or less around the same time uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, a lot of very smart people realized that this property of chemistry has probably very strong implications for the emergence of complex systems uh, in more complex autocatalytic networks. And recently, together with Stuart Kaufman, one of those pioneers, uh, I did work in inferring uh, autocatalytic networks uh, in metabolism of prokaryotes that do not require, in principle and in theory, uh, enzymes to, to be produced. So we found a network that was very conserved and somewhat complex at the intersection between acetogen, uh, one acetogenic bacteria and one methanogenic archaea. And um, the network produces some amino acids, um, nucleobases, acetyl-CoA, which is, is a quite central metabolite. And I'm proposing now that this is one of the possible first universal common ancestors before the origin of the code. We'll see about that. Uh, but for now, let's let it marinate in our heads. So. More recently, some work that I have uh, done with Mike Steele and Daniel Hassan, which is also where we introduced Catalinet, which is a tool where you can uh, explore autocatalysis with your own data set. So if you're interested, I highly recommend that you check it out. And one of the things that we found out is that the expansion of these autocatalytic networks is um, extremely influenced by one single reaction, which is the reversible conversion of NAD and ATP. As I showed you before, these molecules are very related, um, but it, this is not a reaction that is commonly mentioned in biochemistry. So I thought, uh, well, um, maybe this doesn't really happen, but I was uh, happy to find that uh, the reaction has been demonstrated experimentally and it is a reaction that happens with an enzyme uh, in vitro. So I'm looking forward to see more work in the lab uh, in terms of what this inter interconversion uh, might mean for the emergence of metabolism. So to conclude, I think I'm good with time. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight the um, necessity at the emergence of cells. So we all know that cells are extremely complex and uh, for them to have appeared so fast after the origin of Earth, for instance, when you compare the origin of multicellularity, how long that took, um, there, there should be, or an intuition, a respectable intuition says that there should be some necessity at the emergence of cells. Um, and I think part of uh, that path implies the synthesis of new catalysts um, and redox and energy currencies that are more powerful and lead to variation that is selected. Uh, of course, these networks should be encapsulated if we want to have units. Uh, some people propose this to be a miner mineral compartment, others uh, lipid membranes. Uh, there's a lot of work requir required, but we have this kind of image uh, emerging where from linear chemistry, we go to network chemistry uh, that self-sustains itself um, and generates uh, more and more complexity eventually towards LUCA. Of course, there's still a big gap here and that um, is about the origin of template-based replication, which could also be autocatalytic. And so these are some of the questions that I'm interested in and that require a lot of work. Um, for instance, the, the geochemical requirements as well, 
I personally am inclined to believe that the dynamic uh, environment of a hydrothermal vent in terms of pH and temperature would be quite favorable to the emergence of a dynamic system as a cell as well. In fact, when as a bioengineer, you look at these, they, they look very much like bioreactors. Uh, so that should tell us something. Uh, nevertheless, we, we sh should work on it and there is a lot to, to be done. And that uh, doesn't mean that other environments wouldn't be interesting for other uh, processes that could be important at the origin of life. So there are many open questions and um, together with a group of early career researchers, we published this paper uh, that tries to highlight that these questions do not belong in any specific discipline. Uh, I mean, the, the big questions and, and answering them really benefits um, from the interaction of, of disciplines. So we advocate for post-disciplinarity and um, the dialogue, the open dialogue between scientists. So please consider doing that. And that's it for my talk. Do get connected uh, on Twitter. If you're an early career researcher, check out Olin. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Trina. Fascinating talk. Thank um, you. Just uh, looking at the Q and A. So there are not no questions yet, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. We have a, a joint discussion afterwards. Maybe I just ask something very briefly. Um, so so essentially, what you are proposing or what you are working on, you, would you be able to classify this as the the field of metabolism first? I mean, you haven't talked about. I, I suppose there is a link to to Darwinian evolution in some sense. Or how would a, a, a big, relatively complicated metabolic network evolve? It's a good question, but I, I would not classify it as metabolism, metabolism first. In fact, one of the bridges we asked for in this paper I mentioned uh, is that metabolism first and RNA first don't make that much sense when you think about it because of the complexity of what a protocell is. And metabolism is, it means, it comes from Greek, it means change or exchange. So it requires some kind of unity, some kind of membrane. And perhaps to have that, you need already some kind of uh, template uh, polymer. So that could be a protein or RNA. So for the type of complex metabolism we're talking about, I, I am not certain that you could achieve high complexity without some kind of polymer. And I'm more inclined recently for the necessity of transporters um, that would allow for the maintenance of the self stability. But we will see. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, okay. I think that's a, um, a good time now to, to move on to the next talk. We will see Joanna again um, at the panel discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so the next speaker, we move on now to Sarah Walker. I uh, introduced her already earlier, and then we have to see what we can do about Adida. He has some um, difficulties joining. Okay, Sarah, over to you. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. I'm going to share my screen. It's just a little slow loading it. Uh, If there are any other urgent questions, just uh, speak up or uh, write them in the Q&A box. All right, we're good now, you can see? It's coming up. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Um, great, so um, thanks so much for having me um, give this talk. I know I'm one of the organizers and I'm really thrilled to have so many great people here and it's really, um, fantastic to have the discussion. Um, my talk is really going to be about uh, fundamental physics of life and if it exists um, and why um, it might be most apparent in molecules. So I'm deeply interested in the question, what is life? Um, but I think looking at highly organized systems like you and I is actually quite hard to see the physics. Um, and so this idea of seeing what's really there, I think is important because if you look at the history, the progress of physics, 
um, most of our physical theories have not conformed to our intuition for how reality works. They're actually rather surprising. Um, and so one of the things I've been really deeply interested in is whether the physics of life is going to be equally surprising. Um, and I think that other people have also um, uh, thought similarly about it. I think my computer's just being really slow and I'm sorry about that. Um, so Schrodinger has this quote, um, which was already brought up in the introduction to this session um, about the idea of other laws of physics being uh, important when we're talking about physics of life. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of areas of physics that we study um, and we know and love the laws of physics as they are. Um, and I think I wouldn't challenge that any of those are right for their domain of validity. Um, but I would suggest that maybe there are entirely new principles at play and we just haven't been able to see them yet because they are actually only apparent in the phenomena that we call life um, because there is an underlying physics there. So this isn't covering all of the physics that you might learn in undergrad education, but these are sort of the major divisions that we might talk about. Um, and so one of the questions I'm always asking myself is whether um, or not, um, we can actually transport physics as we know it over to life and in what ways we can do that. Um, and it seems to me to be the case that there's a lot of discussion in physics of life community about applying laws as we know it to explain life. Um, but those laws were actually really developed for entirely different questions um, about the nature of physical reality. So for example, thermodynamics was uh, invented to talk about the efficiency of heat engines and why that should apply to life and be the foundational principle explaining life um, to me is a bit perplexing, but I think that'll be something fun to discuss later. Um, so what I wanted to kind of propose is that maybe these um, kind of physics that we have come up with so far are important for certain aspects of reality, but they don't cover all of it. Um, and so I added down here this sort of the laws of what is possible. Um, I call it different things. Usually I think about it in terms of physics of information, um, but um, and that that would be a universal physics in the same way that gravity is a universal physics, but gravity has a domain of validity like at the largest scales in the universe. It really matters, but it doesn't matter inside an atomic nucleus. Um, the laws of what possible or what the physics of information or whatever you want to call it um, is also a universal physics, but it doesn't matter until you get to the scale of the very complex um, things like us. And that's when it becomes the dominant physics once you get into molecules and higher combinatorial um, possibilities. So um, there's a few theories that I think are exploring this kind of idea in interesting ways. The one I'm going to talk about is the one I work on, which is um, called assembly theory. Um, there's also calls set theories, which are theories for gravity that treat events as independent and they're related to um, some of Stuart Kaufman's ideas on the adjacent possible. So I think there's some connection there um, and also constructor theory, which rejects entirely the idea of dynamical laws at all. Um, and initial states and, and treats reality in a really different formalism. So I think we need to be open minded to the possibility of uh, what these laws of life could look like and that they might look radically different than the laws of physics if they've been constructed over the last 300 years because we were asking really different questions before we got to life. Um, and so um, part of this is just trying to see where we are in the history of the progression of human thought. Um, and so um, this list of unifications is from a very nice paper by Frank Wilczek projecting what physics will look like in the next 100 years. Um, and in that paper, uh, Frank even mentions that um, this dichotomy between initial conditions and laws as being separate might need to be resolved and that might be a way forward. Um, the way I think about that from this perspective of thinking about the physics of living matter is that we have these concepts of information like computation which emerged in the last century and we have ideas about matter and its properties that emerged much earlier than that but we finally came up sort of with the standard model and things that we have now also in the last century. So what are the next sets of unifications that we actually really need to think about? And um, one of the features of these unifications is the physics that we came up with after we unified these ideas uh, never looked like what we anticipated before. So I think whatever theory is going to emerge is not going to look like our current theories. Um, and so, uh, so sometimes I talk about the origin of life as a problem of unification. Um, we're not going to understand the transition to the origin of life until we understand the physics that underlies life. And that the physics that underlies life, I think, is this, this sort of very new perspective um, that has to do something with how information becomes a physical feature of matter. 
Um, and um, I like a lot of uh, the ideas in different areas about approaching this. I'm going to talk about um, a few of them. I'm not going to explicitly talk about information for the very reason that I think that we need not um, sort of a Shannon sense of information, but a physical kind of information, um, which has to do with the fact that you can copy different attributes between material substrates and they retain that feature and also that um, information can be causal. So those are the aspects of information that I think are important. Um, and just to kind of hit home the dichotomy between what we're talking about in biology when we're asking for physics of life and what we've done in physics traditionally, um, I think Charles Darwin had maybe the best quote um, that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple getting endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful happen and are being evolved. So I think we're all familiar with this quote, but I think what, um, you know, sort of a key point of it is that in physics, we um, assume that the laws are immutable and they exist autonomous to the system and in some sense there's a problem of where the laws of physics come from in the first place um, because they don't exist within the universe. Um, but when you get to biology you have systems that are writing down theories um, like us and those are changing sort of the physical systems they're in but more generally we have this idea that living systems are generative um, and they don't have fixed rules over time and this is actually the process that we call evolution. Um, so somehow we need to try to figure out how these kind of two very different descriptions of physical reality can exist in the same universe. Um, and um, what I'm going to talk about for this talk is actually just how we can start to see some of these ideas in biochemistry itself. Um, and I'm not going to get into a lot of details because we don't have a lot of time uh, for this talk, um, but I do want to touch on this idea of universality in biochemistry. Um, which is an important concept that we have a single sample of life on Earth. And as Joanna was um, just talking about in the last talk and was also alluded to in the introduction, we have common biochemical components across all of that. And that's one of the reasons that we have evidence for a last universal common ancestor. Um, and the idea of focusing on the specific components of the features of life on Earth is really embedded in this idea that life is chemistry. So the molecules that are involved in living systems are essentially life. And in astrobiology, um, this assumption is not often made explicit, but it's very implicit because we're always conducting our search for life on other planets by looking for molecules that life on Earth uses. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves if this is really the best way of doing it. And if we're thinking about life as a universal phenomena, a phenomena that can potentially arise anywhere in the universe because the physics itself is universal, then maybe we need to abstract away from the specific details of the chemistry of life on Earth. Um, and so the first um, part I'm going to talk about getting into some more technical content rather than philosophical content is this idea of assembly theory, um, which is a, a proposal of a sort of new theory um, that would be explanatory of life um, that originated in the lab of Lee Cronin, but the ideas are, are things that we've been working on together. For years, he's been doing the experimental and theory part, and I've been working a lot on the theory and connecting it to physics of information. Um, and the basic conjecture of assembly theory is that physical objects like molecules and tables and chairs and people live in a space called an assembly space. Um, and it's very easy to articulate what an assembly space is for a molecule. An assembly space is very different than a physical space or some of the other spaces that we talk about in physics um, currently, but it is a very real space um, potentially, and it is observationally accessible, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but what an assembly space is, if you imagine a molecule, you can break it apart into all of its fragments and then you can build up all the possible ways of assembling the molecule. And that's what we call an assembly space. And in assembly theory, a molecule is not a molecule as we see it. You know, we measure its properties in the lab. It is an assembly space. It's an instance of a particular causal structure of all of these pathways of building an object. So a molecule encodes all its possible histories. Um, in that assembly structure. And you can talk about the complexity of a molecule as the shortest path in that space. Um, so just shown here is how we do that in terms of assembling bonds to count up the number of possible bonds to build up a molecule um, for ATP. Now the important part of assembly spaces for me and why I started really getting interested in this as a pathway into getting in some of the deeper conceptual ideas about what a fundamental physics of life might look like um, is that it's observationally tractable. So this idea of fragmenting molecules and looking at their parts um, is something that an uh, instrument called a mass spec does anyway. And so uh, Lee's lab has actually mapped um, measurements in a mass, mass spec to the assembly index, the shortest path in the space 
of molecules and been able to um, observationally verify um, that there's a strong correlation there and then use that to show that the only physical systems we know that make high complexity molecules are living systems. And so this was published in a paper um, very recently. Um, and the key point I want to make here is we've been applying assembly theory to molecules, but the idea is you could fragment yourself and all of your possible histories would also be encoded in that structure of you as a physical object. Um, and then also you exist in space time, so you might think of an assembly of, of the space time coordinates and all of those kind of things, but, um, but that's to be developed. Um, but the key conjecture of assembly theory that I think is important is that there's a threshold, which might be a constant of nature in the same sense that the Planck constant is constant in nature, the fine structure constant, um, in assembly spaces above which living physics is necessary. What I mean by living physics is physics of information has to exist in those systems in order to get to that complexity threshold. The reason being that the probability of seeing objects um, and where we see that observationally experimentally is at an MA of 15 is so improbable you would never expect to find them in high abundance. So it's not going against the laws of physics. It's saying that they can, you know, these things can spontaneously form with exceptionally low probability, but observationally you're never likely to observe them and you're certainly not likely to observe say 10,000 copies necessary to observe them in a mass spec. Um, and so for me, this is trying to really articulate the possibility that there's actually a threshold um, in, phys in physical reality above which you require information in order for those objects to exist. This is what assembly theory is trying to get at. So we're trying to formalize this concept of information assembly theory now um, and relate it to the causal histories necessary for the universe to undergo to, to construct specific objects. Um, and so that's sort of where the current state of that is. Um, I am uh, going to just kind of breeze through the next part of my talk, which is just to talk about universality beyond life on Earth. So not just talking about the assembly theory part, but also how do we actually extrapolate beyond in other ways molecules, um, properties of molecules. So there is a um, uh, sort of set of ideas that my lab has been working on, which we call planetary systems biochemistry, which is to look at biochemistry, all the molecules that life on Earth uses and the cataloged reactions that we know about that are catalyzed by enzymes and try to look for scaling properties to see if there's any law-like behavior. So again, this is trying to move away from thinking about the specific molecules um, on life on Earth um, and thinking about general properties. So assembly theory tells us there's sort of a complexity threshold and life can only make things above that threshold. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be like molecules on Earth. Here we're looking at instead at statistical patterns in the properties of the molecules and reactions. Um, so it's kind of a, getting a window into a similar physics and same properties, but looking at it from a very different perspective. Um, to look at scaling behavior and statistics, we have to build ensembles just like we do in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. Um, and so we built um, large ensembles of, of biochemical networks across different scales of organization. Um, and the particular results I'm going to show you are related to coarse graining of chemical reaction space. So if you look at the kind of biochemical reactions life on Earth uses, um, there's actually um, a way that they're cataloged um, called enzyme commission numbers that hierarchically organizes them by function. And you can look at the broadest class of enzyme function um, as sort of the highest level of coarse graining, so the largest bins for functions that biochemistry uses. Um, and those functions are listed here. I'm not going to go through them because we don't have a lot of time, but you can see our preprint on BioArchive. Um, and um, if you look at total enzymes and the number of each kind of enzyme function, what we were looking for is whether or not there was particular scaling behavior associated to that. Um, and in fact, we do find that enzyme functions exhibit universal scaling laws. Um, and they fall into a few different classes. So some of the enzyme functions are super linear, some are linear, some are sublinear, but we see universal behavior across the different domains of life and also across scales of organizations. So metagenomes are really looking at the ecosystem level scale. Um, I don't have time to get into the details, but I just want to make the point that these universality classes are different than bio, the biochemical notion of universality where you have shared component parts um, because we've actually been able to show there's not a correlation between the behavior, the scaling and the universality of component parts of the biochemistry. So whether enzymes are shared across organisms or not does not matter for these emergent patterns that we see in the scaling behavior. Um, and what we're trying to do now is use these scaling laws as a way of looking at statistical properties of biochemistry independent of the component parts to predict both features of 
the earliest life on Earth in terms of sort of, in this case, um, distributions of different functions that the last universal common ancestor might have had. Or you can imagine uh, growing biochemistry from geochemical conditions on other planets and using these coarse grain constraints to actually predict what kinds of biochemical systems could exist in different geochemical environments. Um, and so those are two things that we're doing. We are currently looking at the last universal common ancestor uh, consensus model given to us by our col colleague Aaron Goldman um, and demonstrating that it's not consistent with the universality classes that we observe for modern life, which either means that there was some phase transition probably in early life anyway to these um, universality classes, but whether it was at the time of LUCA or not um, is an interesting question. Um, so just to summarize this last part, um, when we're talking about universality and biochemistry, traditionally it's been about molecules. Um, the work we're trying to do is push it beyond looking at molecules to look at statistical patterns. And some of these patterns that we're seeing emerge are independent of the details of the component chemistry, which is suggestive they might be more universal organizing principles for life. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude on one of my favorite quotes about the dichotomy between physics as we know it now. Um, which is we use to describe objectively properties of the universe and then the physics as I hope to understand it in life, which has to do with intelligent information processing systems actually interacting with that physics and changing the possibilities or generating new possibilities in the universe and how we can actually get at that physics. And with that, I'm going to thank my group um, and collaborators, in particular Lee Cronin, Chris Kempies, and Michael Lockman um, have been working together a lot on the assembly theory ideas and where we're going with it and Aaron Goldman for the um, Luca Models and Paul Davies for being an awesome mentor and I work with an awesome group of postdocs and grad students that I am always thrilled to interact with. So thanks. Thank you Sarah. Thank you for your talk. So there have been a couple of questions also some related to China but maybe we can come back to this uh, later in the panel discussion and there, have, there are now a couple of questions for a few questions for Sarah and if I can, I don't know if I can summarize them very quickly. So it seems to be about the physics of information and um, also the link to Shannon entropy. And a similar question I also had. So Sarah, I think in the beginning you said, you know, you're not talking about Shannon entropy and then you talk about this assembly theory, which yeah. is another measure of, of complexity. And I guess one question might be, you know, how, how they are linked um, and, and also how this links to physics of information. Yeah, so um, so it's hard. Uh, I can try to give a short answer to that, which is the way I think about Shannon theory is it's really capturing correlations between different physical systems, but it depends on sort of how you're observing them because you have to actually label the states of the system. And this is also something that I find deeply intriguing about the way we do thermodynamics. In assembly theory, what we're saying is the, the assemblyness of an object is a physically observable attribute, and it is actually a feature of the physical structure. Um, and in some ways, uh, you should think about that as um, sort of how much information that assembly index is related to how much information is necessary to create an object in the universe. But I mean it in terms of number of events or steps, um, not in a Shannon sense of information. And I think where Shannon comes into it is if I start looking at interactions between these objects and the statistics of interactions, some of Shannon's formalism is going to be really relevant to talking about that, but I want to look at the underlying sort of evolutionary pathways the universe takes and what objects are necessary to actually catalyze new transformation. So each step in that assembly pathway requires potentially a constructor or an object that has um, the ability to mediate that transformation. So what we're, it, what we're saying is when you get to the physics of life, the laws become very local because they're local to specific objects that are necessary to mediate specific transformations to happen in the universe that are consistent with the laws of physics. But the laws of physics don't tell you which transformations do happen. They tell you what can happen. And the objects themselves tell you what does happen. Yeah, very good. I mean, there are several questions. I think I, I think uh, you, you address them in one way or another. Um, just very briefly, um, before we move on to the next speaker, I guess there's also the issue of the value of information in information theory and biology. You know, that's, I think there are some quite well-known papers on that as well. And I know Bill Bialik was wondering about this as well. Would you say now you, you somehow bypass this problem because your steps in assembly, um, they are certainly important uh, to, to get the thing, the, the molecule of interest uh, assembled. Um, and um, and I suppose these are critical steps anyway. So, so there's no, there's maybe no question even of, of the value of information, or, or would you not think of about this issue like that? I think they're, I think they're just, 
I, I think there will be a deep connection, but I think they're very far afield from like what they're addressing and what they're asking right now. So I work in both information theory and assembly theory, and I just think about them in completely different domains when I'm trying to apply them and think about them. But I think the properties that we associate to the value of information and its role in biology are an emergent property, the fact that life exists in assembly spaces. That that would be the, the cleanest way I can say it simply. Um, but uh, but I think the problem the, the problem there's a lot of problems with information theory applied to life that we talk about, like the fact it doesn't cover semantic information. You have to label the states. You have to know what the sort of properties of the channel are, are ahead of time and all these other features. And I think um, what we're trying to do is dig a little deeper and see if there's there's some other underlying feature that's more objective. OK, um, just one thing I noticed here is the last question was about Wolfram's uh, hypergraphs in the new kind of science. I don't know. Does it tell you anything? And is there any? Oh, I just wanna, yeah, I, I think those ideas are also related, right? Because Wolfram's talking about these the causal structure in terms of these hypergraphs. I think there's a, a few subtle differences in the way we talk about the physics um, in assembly theory and what Wolfram's trying to do in the hypergraphs. So one thing is Wolfram's uh, objective is to reconstruct known physics, not to discover new physics. And I think what we're doing in assembly theory is trying to discover the physics of life and have it be observationally testable in the lab that we can actually de novo evolve life from scratch in the lab. The fact that those those physical theories have similar structure is deeply interesting um, and probably is telling us something because assembly theory, if you look at any theories of physics, is closest in relation to theories of quantum gravity in terms of its structure, which I find deeply intriguing. <laughs> um, but that's a whole whole separate can of worms. It would yeah. be a very long conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's another one, but we can come to back, back to this um, in, the, in the panel discussion. So now we have um, Dieter Brown joining us. I'm really glad um, it, it worked out and um, fantastic to see you. Um, I introduced Dieter before. He's at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and I'm um, uh, happy to hear your talk. Thank you. Okay, yes. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me? Share, you see the screen? Perfect. Here we go. So I had to move for another computer. So basically, it's too heretic to ask Microsoft to write software for Linux, I guess. <laughs> so. Um, Yes, we try to approach uh, life from uh, experiments, bottom-up experiments. I want to share with you what we did the last years. Um, basically, the question is, you know, the Earth very violent early on, and then connect the dots to get somewhere close to replicating system, molecular systems in there. And the two movies who didn't make the move to the new computer are movies on Iceland, you know, volcanic island, you have high, you know, porous rock, a lot of uh, warm uh, vapor flowing by. And if you walk over Iceland, what, what is really peculiar, and that's for all volcanic systems, that it has very porous rocks out there. And that's kind of the starting position where we try to start doing experiments. And uh, what we are doing in the lab is we make mimics of what could happen in these pores if they're exposed to temperature differences. And the latest, uh, the latest iteration of that is, is uh, where we look at pores which are only half filled by water. The other end is by air. And there's an interesting evaporation precipitation dynamics going on. Basically, if you look inside and you have oligonucleotides, RNA, DNA, shorter strands, and you label them fluorescently, you can figure out that this evaporation condensation dynamics already at these moderate temperatures give you a, a reasonably fast and strong accumulation. I mean, uh, you get about a 200 fold accumulation within five minutes of these nucleotides at the interface, which make it quite an interesting place to look at experimentally. So. Basically, there are surface tension effects, there's evaporation, there's coffee ring effect. This model, which is behind uh, fitting these experimental findings, is basically mostly driven by the capillary flow of the evaporation and the diffusion of the molecules against that, and therefore they accumulate at the interface. But this accumulation was at this uh, water interface, not the only point which showed interesting dynamics here. Uh, beside that accumulation, we've seen uh, many important reactions for prebiotic life at this interface. One of them is if you not only have a, you know, a large bubble, but even a small bubble of air, you do find in the temperature difference that molecules are in the similar way as you see before, evaporating, recondensing, therefore concentrating at this interface 
as they can't go with the water into the gas bubble for the cold side. And you actually find a crystallization, which is very peculiar, very nice defined uh, for, in this case, a, a precursor molecule for RNA synthesis. So if you think about chirality, this would be an issue where this in special the case is a case where these crystals are homochiral in their composition. So beside that small molecules can be accumulated, actually also um, salts are accumulating in the settings. Uh, the wet dry cycling at the interface, because the interface is moving up and down, gives you also potential for, for a dry wet cycle where you can actually phosphorylate uh, nucleotides. So it's also an important uh, part in the mixture towards more complex RNA molecules. But then if you have longer, oli longer oligonucleotides of RNA, they can be catalytic. Here it's a catalysis where it cleaves a substrate and therefore enhances the fluorescence. It's a hammerhead ribozyme and it, you know, it doesn't do the make it more complex, but actually destroying it. And uh, what is interesting to see that the accumulation of the salts and the molecules at the interface is boosting the reaction tremendously. And ribozymes have a very nice time at this interface to the point that they actually produce so much material which comes down into the whole liquid part. Um, but that's not all. If you have RNA DNA which is self-sticky to the point that it can make large aggregates, almost like in a phase transition, uh, they accumulate to the point to really make large parts uh, and they only do so if they have complementary sequences. So the accumulation can trigger actually a large scale formation, which can be very stable because very stable against hydrolysis in the stranded state. But also the same happens for lipids. In left hand side, you have a, a lipid fluorescence channel, right hand side a DNA fluorescence channel. And the combination of the accumulation of the DNA at the interface and the accumulation of the lipids at the interface actually leads to what you see here as particles which both have lipids and DNA and you can show if you go in more detail that these are protecting the DNA in the center and also this Marangoni flows which are very strong lead to fission events up here. So that, that brought us to the idea that we should push more at these conditions because a lot of interesting effects come together so we're pushing right now RNA polymerization that these phosphorylated nucleotides will actually go for longer polymers and you know that's kind of the down the road hope that we can go bottom up from nucleotides to lifelike systems and if you go for replication we've shown that with proteins in the past and we push more now to do the same thing without proteins so this is a don't go in detail here it's basically length selective replication based on thermophoresis to accumulate molecules and we managed uh, last year to figure out a way to make a RNA version of that. So here it has to be optimized in a very localized heating that molecules only go through this high temperature step to separate the strands in a short time um, because otherwise the RNA which is actually driving the reaction is destroyed. So the degradation time becomes very short and uh, because they run this reaction at very high salt concentrations. This is a tricky situation to balance, uh, replication, and destruction at the same time. So this is not yet at the position to replicate these 200 basis long ribozymes at the same time, but we've seen interestingly enough that they form aggregates also in this case under the native conditions where uh, Jerry Joyce with whom we collaborated here is uh, optimizing these conditions. And those again have an effect based on thermophoresis movement of molecules and temperature gradient to accumulate in a ring-like uh, pattern and therefore gives us also a protective environment uh, for these molecules. So in general we can replicate and we can try to push it but one has to be a little bit aware of that if we only replicate randomness uh, we might be trapped in a situation where the sequences not become long enough but become interesting enough and to really make that uh, ribozyme functions. Ribozymes are 200 mers, even tRNA 70 mers, large molecules. And the big question is what selection uh, comes in place before we can hope that information is replicated well enough and selected well enough that we can think about RNA world scenarios or self-replicating scenarios. So one thing we, we observe and are quite intrigued by that it's a symmetry breaking 
like dynamics in sequence space. Uh, it's a paper 2019 I won't talk about, but something we published uh, now, um, where we just start from random sequences and add a reaction. Again, we cheat a bit. We have a protein doing it, but it's something you could think that a very simple prebiotic uh, reaction could bring it about, which is doing a templated ligation. So the strands come together in a three body a conformation and are linked in the template. So the interesting thing is, uh, well, on the one hand side, these strands tend to make longer strands quite fast and quite long. That's something you would have expected a bit. There are a lot of interesting details if you go for real modeling of these systems, because you have to assume that this is actually um, happening in, in the conformation. If you really go for equilibrium, it would actually, these strands would find its counterpart and would not have the overlap. So there's an interesting kinetic aspect to that. But if you look at this and you start with these random distributions, so they have a Gaussian distribution of T. We talk here about only two bases because Again, interesting kinetic effect. If we start with four bases, it doesn't work at all because the strands don't have enough time to find themselves. But then if you look for the first strand, which is 24 mer, they actually find, you find a very distinct um, bimodal distribution, which you can assign to that these strands are selected out if they can make these happen. So the strands rather have a lot of A or had a lot of T bases, but nothing in between because that tends to run into a lot of hairpins. So even these very simple replication systems apparently have a strong way to select themselves. And uh, beside of that A type and T type pattern, you can see here in the between that you get a zebra shaped pattern, which is also quite peculiar and the self amplification of the ligation site. Uh, in short, if you look, it is a little bit further out. We do Illumina sequencing on these on these strands, which are capable of making the longer strands. You actually find two worlds of two networks of A type, T type linking together, almost being fully complementary, and then actually can make networks of replication. So if you start from randomness, what you get out of that such a system is not just a random long strands, you rather get networks of strands which have a higher concentration, therefore find themselves faster in the mixture and are able to make more template of their sequence and therefore replicate themselves in a cooperative manner. That can be understood to the point that you can make those networks and test them and yes, they work as expected, but it shows actually that if we look at sequences, cooperative, very simple reactions working together leads to quite an interesting uh, evolutionary dynamics. Probably not yet, you know, Darwin in evolution, a little bit in between, between the randomness short strands and the long strands you want to have, but it structures the sequence in a very peculiar, interesting way. I think that's a much interesting mechanisms to find because the jump for ribozymes is a large one. So before I, I stop, I don't have enough time, just want to mention a paper where we work on tRNA sequences where a replicator is only thermally self-assembling, but as I said, there's not enough time, but it might be interesting if you're interested in translation, origin of translation, the connection to a replication, you might want to have a look at that. And with that, I, I like to end and um, all the PhD, mostly PhD students doing the work and Christoph Mast, the master of microfluidics in the lab. I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dieter. Fantastic talk. Um, yeah, while we wait for questions in the Q&A, um, I, I can ask something, I can start. Um, so I was thinking, so uh, in your experiments or the experiments you described, you start with, um, you know, it starts, it's a, it's a relatively uh, simple uh, um, a system, I think, you know, because you're trying to push down to the origin of life, obviously, but then, um, of course, you still start with a high energy nucleotides, or in one case, you had the protein, and in another case, you had the complicated ribozyme. So, I guess, I guess the question is, you know, to uh, how far do you think to get to the stage where you where you don't need this input? So, I guess I'm thinking of some some miller yuri experiment, you know, all you have is some a bunch of stuff in the soup and you, you know, stimulate it somehow and, and so on and then the whole, it all goes. 
Yes, I mean, the, the standard, you know, RNA world assumes a triphosphate nucleotide, and that's something, uh, you know, you have an activated molecule. It's already very complex compared to what you discuss here, uh, and that's quite hard to get periodically. And, and at the same time, it doesn't give you much on the polymerization side, uh, but, uh, you know, it's work in progress, but we see polymerization from a very simple phosphorylation state of a nucleotide, which is prebiotically plausible and you can think of that if you've managed to get some way into the nucleotide business uh, then phosphorylation is part of the deal and then polymerization is likely also possible in these conditions in very mild settings and then if the polymerization goes and it you know takes away the nucleotides and kind of you know removes those from the mixture it also you know moves the whole reaction from the low side but that said, you know, of course, having a, just a sugar soup and just a base soup is a very tough way to get to RNA. But let's see. I mean, uh, I just see this quite encouraging to to push on and let's see how far we can get. Uh, it, it's an experimental question has to be shown experimentally. Yeah. Can I ask a similar uh, sort of follow up, a related follow up question? Uh, how concentration dependent is this process? In the sense that, like, if it, you know, you you have these beautiful results at high concentrations of you know polymer of you know nucleotide uh, soup. If it was one one thousandth the concentration, you know, does the sort of fundamental kinetics of it still favor polymerization, or is it is it is it is there a sort of a tipping point of concentration required? I mean. One thing is always how much is is your you know mixture tolerant to to other molecules and that you can test. But then on the other hand side, you know what I uh, would need a little bit more detail here how the wet dry cycling is working here that accumulates molecules a lot. You have this this um, surface uh, coffee ring effect which accumulates 200 fold. You on top can make this at the bottom of a longer, short you know thermal. Uh, gradient chamber which accumulates million folds by thermophoresis. So uh, yes, concentration is a problem, but there are physical means by, you know, we specialize a bit on the temperature alone. There might be other ways, but temperature alone is already giving you a cascade where you can slowly feed this with low concentrations and then at one position in, you know, 100 by 100 by 100 micrometers in your experiment, you can get those concentrations and um, uh, so we are very much aware of that concentration dependence, but you know we have struggled a lot and explored a lot of methods to accumulate it. While you know not having running away effects, if you have really wet dry cycles which are not diffusively coupled as they are in here, they have a bit the tendency to amass a lot of salts, have a shift of pH because as you evaporate, you remove water you can actually not feed it again because if you bring in other molecules, you bring in more and more and more stuff and therefore shift your pH and shift the salt. So in these conditions, that wet dry cycling is very local and you can feed by diffusion the system and therefore you know, also remove and, and keep the pH constant and, and keep. So, so those are microfluidic experiments we can do now in the lab and, and you, you know, we see polymerizations in one day. You, you know, can run that for a week or two, and, and with all the nice methodology of mass spec, uh, Illumina sequencing, you know, there's many, many ways to look at the system and uh, and and ask the question. You know, will will it be possible? And I think you know, with what we see, there's plenty of interesting things coming up in the future on this. Uh, yeah. I still see a lot of momentum and. Doing this in this non-equilibrium setting, you get very interesting results, I think. Good. Any any more questions? Um, just uh, let me just check one more time. Uh, wonderful talk, Dieter. In your opinion, what is missing in plan to experimentally show Darwinian evolution through using your system? I mean, I mean, these systems here on the right hand side that they are already Darwinian in the sense that you you're replicating and the replication gives you longer strands. You know, very often in, in Darwinian pre Darwinian evolution, you replicate things, but then uh, you, you run the problem with the Spiegelmann monster that you get shorter, shorter strands because shorter strands replicate faster, you know, so but but this is one case where the longer ones replicating better, okay, with the use of a protein. And um, 
we learned a lot on this, and if we have a polymerization dynamics, a ligation dynamics, we can hopefully not too hard, you know, transfer that also to a system where, you know, things get longer and longer. As you can see in the, in the ligation experiments, this is done in a simple test tube, and we start to put this also on these non-equilibrium settings. Um, so when does it become Darwinian? Um, the, the funny question is here all the time, what's your function you're selecting for? And of course, you always want to have a protein or a special self-helping reaction. Um, well, the first self-helping reaction is to, to survive longer, so to make hydrolysis less for RNA, to have um, sequence space which can ligate, replicate fast. And I think that those kind of rather physical selection pressures, which you're probably not yet associating fully with Darwinian evolution because it's not what you're used to in biology, is already almost Darwinian evolution, right? And um, I think you can go quite a long way by first putting it on physical means of, of selection and probably get to 200 mers or something, and, and then you, you will get to to feedback cycles where the replication is self-stabilizing and self-helping. Um, yeah, again, you know, we were, we've were we been amazed here, right? I mean, you take random sequences, you get longer ones, that's nice, but actually it's not random anymore. So so it is, it is just a nice piece of, of non-equilibrium biophysics to be fully explored. And after seeing it, you understand, yes, of course, you know, afterwards you say, yes, of course, apparently, um, Obviously, right? So hopefully we'll also have some obviously event in understanding Darwin and evolution at its onset. So so Dita, just just um we, we should move on to the panel discussion, but maybe sure. one question. I don't know if you can answer it in one minute or, or not in one minute, sure. even in one sentence. It's uh, it um it says uh, you mentioned briefly about random experiments structuring the sequences in a particular way. Do you see any signatures of these and viruses? If, if, if you know what, what this question means and if you can answer it in one sentence, then please go ahead. I mean, viruses have a genetic code that, that's already much, much evolved. We are talking way below virus, so I think that's disconnected. Okay. Okay, so then, uh, thank you again, Dieter, and all the speakers. And uh, I invite you to, to join with your camera on so we can start this more broader panel discussion, how we call it. Um, I think yeah, Dita is here, Sarah is here, and Joanna. Are we missing anyone? No. Good. Fantastic. So, so the, the idea is now that we have uh, the, the speakers and the organizers uh, joining us, and um, and so we can broaden up this discussion. So there are still some questions um, on the chat box, maybe um, because it was cut short initially with with Joanna's talk. Maybe let me ask her a quick question before we start with a more general discussion. Um, uh, just one second. Um, I guess, okay, nice talk, China. Do you think an underlying network of proteins embeds a so-called template in terms of organismic evolution? In simpler terms, the network is the cause of the template. I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me try. Um, so I think you know. <laughs> oh, sorry, we talk about you know RNA being the template uh, for 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 itself, and and the, I guess the question is, does a network can it function as a similar level? Well, theoretically, yes. Um, just because the chemical structure is maintained and it's a template for itself, so that's the basic definition of a collectively autocatalytic set in chemistry. Now, experimentally with small molecules, there has been little work. So I'm hoping to see more in the future. And I'm not advocating that the networks we find will be seen exactly like that in the lab. So definitely there, there has to be more work in the lab to see if they how far they can go and they can be self-sustained and self-maintained without uh, the aid of templates and uh, polymers, I'm sorry. But okay. so theoretically, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, so thank you everyone for for Someone joining. is still sharing their screen, sorry. <laughs> Just a note, I think. It might be um, it might be the producer of the event, Aka, so we can see each other, I don't know. Um, 
so maybe let me just start something here. Um, so let's open up this discussion. So the idea is also that speakers can can uh, ask each other questions. So maybe let me just start this whole thing with with one with one question. So um, so we had these different uh, very different talks, which was fantastic. So we had the metabolic networks. Then we had the I don't know RNA world from Dieter Brown um, or this non-equilibrium setting. And then we had, uh, you know, Sarah's uh, assembly theory and, and, and really cool uh, theoretical ideas. Um, so I guess, you know, if you talk about the origin of life like a singular event, would it then mean that at least two of you three are wrong in terms of explaining it? Or, or do you think it's it can be all of the above? So to anyone. Uh, I would say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I think uh, just on the experimental side, there is something that we talk a lot about in the context of assembly theory that I think is critically important, which is we never quantify how much information we're putting into prebiotic experiments. Um, so you have to think about the fact that when you design an experiment, you're manipulating conditions <laughs> and then you're actually putting information in. Um, I think Dieter's experiments are trying to minimize the amount of information in, and that's one of the nice things about what he's doing. But I think um, trying to make that explicit might be more helpful for seeing sort of the underlying physics from the way we talk about it in assembly theory. Because you have to actually talk about the constraints you're putting on the system before you can talk about what information is emerging in the system. Um, and of course, uh, the other feature I would say is that um, we do have some uh, some of the theory work we're doing now, which indicates that copying or reproducing systems are necessary to get to high assembly objects, which is one of the reasons that I say there's a deep connection between assembly theory and the physics of information. If you don't have copying events, physical system propagating information in the future, you're never going to get to a high assembly object. Um, and that's sort of one of the conjectures that we have right now that we're trying to demonstrate. Just. I mean, I mean, all of these systems are are informing themselves. You know, that's why I think it's 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 important to to look at all of them and combine it. You know, of course, it would be interesting to be more explicit about information content in the system. And let's see. I mean, uh, we're quite open in what we do, but of course, it's uh, we have to get it going at some point, and then we can hopefully reduce, uh, make it more realistic, more you know optimize its um, information as amassing or its probability, right? At the end of the day, we have to talk about probabilities of, of immersions of life if we manage to once make it convincingly. And then all these theories are will be important, yeah. Uh, to me, it was never helpful to think who is right or wrong. I like to think in terms of explanations and their power, the power of the explanatory power of theory and experiments. Um, I do think that what Sarah brought up in terms of the information we put in is important, but also to mention that whenever we build a model of any type, a model in science, we do put constraints in and that's what makes a model work. So I do not see how else we could uh, access what happened at the origin of life without uh, good models, good theories, good simulations. So there, this will always be. <laughs> it's just the way that science works. And you're much faster as experimentalist if you if you you know listen to theoreticians because they will tell you you know this is a good direction and they will tell you this is a bad direction. Um, I think I fully agree. Yeah. So, for instance, um, the theoretical work Sarah and uh, China described. I mean, do you think data that could be applied to model your experiments, or is it is it is it not close enough? You know, I mean, that's the importance of modeling. Sometimes you 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 need the model very close. So we do a lot of ComSol finite element simulation that we really know the flow of speeds and all the details that we, you know, we're not doing stupid experimental runs where nothing works. But then you have, you know, this overlaying theoretical levels and all of them have their validity because in ComSol you can't simulate, you know, sequence space or, or, or assembly dynamics or information in the way you know, you can do these theoretical models um, which are a little bit more overarching. You know, sometimes, uh, of course, we'd love to see it a little bit more applied to what, what really is possible and link it, but I see it. Uh, the trend is uh, over the last years that it gets more and more, you know, 
we're moving together. We're not moving further apart. That's what I see. Can I clarify the point I made just a little bit in response to Joanna's comment? Because I think the comment about we always have to have a model and an experiment and a theory is totally valid. I think my point was more we have to understand how we're setting up the initial conditions relative to what it is we hope to observe. Um, and so in any experiment, you need to control for your starting conditions. And my point was just that I think historically, because we haven't understood the question we're asking, we haven't necessarily been setting up experiments in the way that we understand exactly what we're inputting as the boundary condition for the experiment relative to what we want to get out. Um, so one way I would articulate that is everything that goes into the experiment is itself a product of evolution or a chemist designing something. And that means that there was evolutionary information or intelligent information put into the experiment. And once we understand how to quantify that, we can control for those boundary conditions and then ask how much information are we getting out of the experiment relative to what we put in. And that that's something that you can actually formalize in assembly theory. And and I think that's just a really important point. It, whether that or not that's the right theory for doing it is a different question, but I think it's just something that has been raised in an interesting way in the way we talk about it in assembly theory that is relevant no matter what physics ends up describing origins of life is we have to be aware of what we're putting in and what we're getting out with respect to where we are in the evolutionary history of objects in the universe that are life. Every experiment we create is a product of life. So we have to know how much we're putting in. I mean, in physics, we don't have a theory of non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics of non-equilibrium events. So, so all that interaction of boundary conditions with the molecules is just all also new physics. So it's it's yeah. you know that's why we got funding early on, also from the, mostly from the physics side because they think, oh, we don't know, we want to know. So, um, but then the more close you get to the molecules, I think the, the better and better you can use assembly theories and do those theories, but. Uh, We'll have to be a bit open to how those boundary condition molecule interactions, what 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 possibilities we are missing out still, right? Um, but that's a adventurous path uh, pathway which is in front of us, I think. So, so Dieter, I'm just also to clarify this again. So, for your experiments, you don't need theory to constrain your experiments. So, you you don't need a prediction from theory to implement your experiments. Is it sort of uh, intuition you have to so set up these experiments or does most of them doesn't do, most of them don't work and once in a while you get something which works um in, it's in stepwise it's a stepwise thing so, so so some things we we do know before that it will work but then we we hopefully are always open to things where we say okay this sounds interesting this is polymerizing this is ligating uh we are we really sure that we know already so let's try out and and you know it's a bit 50 50 it's not 50 percent you know already yeah that must go in that direction but 50 percent is just blue sky and, and uh, i think the beauty of the field is that you can do both and and uh, if you're lucky both works well we are not reporting on all those experiments which didn't work so yeah, as usual <laughs> it's already a good selection principle okay just another quick comment since um, no one else says anything so the, you said you know there's no theory for non-equilibrium physics i mean I'm, I'm i'm sure the speakers of the next uh, session would disagree um so you don't think that um that kind of theory can help uh, make predictions for experiments and make even theoretical prediction about the origin of life? Well, well, they will to some degree, but if you're really, really far from equilibrium and you easily are far from equilibrium, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you know, it's always good if theoreticians say, look, there's some interesting coupling and there's something this, you know, you have interesting feedback loop. That's always something where as experimentalists you say, oh, let's have a look, you know. Is there something? Uh, and then can, I just see a lot of interesting connections back forth between molecules and, and boundary conditions. I, you know, initially we thought temperature gradient something boring, right? I mean, and we've continuously see interesting uh, things coming up. So uh, let's see. I mean, I'm not. I'm, it doesn't have to be thermal origin of life. That, that, that's fine. But but some non-equilibrium is always kind of fun to look at. So, so maybe, maybe I, I uh, ask some questions to uh, Dieter here. So, so you 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 emphasize on the boundary condition, but it seems to me all all you 
we're talking about is some kind of compartmentalization. It could be a 3D into a 2D, so there is a air water interface, or it could be a uh, compartmentalization still in 3D into a small drops where concentration is uh, again increased. So, so do you see a distinction between boundary condition and just general compartmentalization due to potentially phase separation? You know, I, I would be a bit stiff here because uh, compartments don't do anything. You know, compartments are dead. Uh, they are not. A compartment that they are not accumulating. The they are not. Hmm? Well, if you do phase separation, you would have a potentially higher concentration of material to do reaction with. Yeah, but um, that, that you talk well. Okay, that that's a longer discussion on on. But but if you, you know, I think the important ingredient is actually not boundary conditions, and not uh, not compartments or anything. It's more. How do you keep your system out of equilibrium? Because that's what living systems are about. They, they can keep themselves out of equilibrium nowadays. And mm -hmm. early on, it, it was more how could the environment keep it out of equilibrium? Because I think only then you have a chance to replicate things, accumulate things, work against the second law of thermodynamics, and mm -hmm. uh, you know get evolution going. So whatever you find out to keep your thing out of equilibrium, then it's getting interesting for origins of life. And, and, and often in chemistry, it's the opposite. You know, you have two pure materials completely out of equilibrium, you put it together, you mix it, you know, it will just decay into equilibrium and die out. So we have to kind of work against that reflex uh, mm -hmm. normals that the chemist has. So compartmentalization, of course, can also be stabilized by non euclidean effect. I mean, for example, the lava lamp that some people may have, not seeing those blobs rising and, and lowering. You know, you know the story of gradient. The story of coercivates, uh, of, of, you know, assembling things uh, has always been seen. You can see it optimistically or pessimistically, and, and in many cases they, they just form the coercivate and then are less active because it's just binding the molecules to a lot of other molecules and therefore don't have the freedom to actually do the reaction anymore. So it's a, you know, it's a trade off of accumulation by binding to something and then it's not fully clear what the advantage is at the, at the end of the day. Uh, that, that's probably now a pessimistic way, but there are nice potentials on, on, on coercivate systems for sure. But yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question in the in the uh, commentary in the Q and A box. Um, I might have misunderstood this, but Sarah Walker showed that the Lucas enzymes are in a different universality class than modern life. But Schreiner showed that you can reconstruct some parts of Luca bi biochemical network from modern life data. Are these two ideas at odds? Uh, they're not actually at odds. I think what we were trying to show is there's different ways of constructing LUCA, and some of them are phylogenetic, and then there's sort of the way that Joanna's been trying to do it, also reconstructing from modern reaction networks. And what we're suggesting is there's this third way of trying to look at LUCA by looking at the universality classes, and not those reconstructions don't match up yet, but specific phylogenetic reconstructions don't reproduce the same exact LUCA. And I think Joanna made the good point of hers being one example of LUCA. Uh, and the way I think about LUCA is not an individual model, but a class of models with certain properties. And I think what we're trying to do is constrain properties of that class of models using these statistical relationships. And something like Joanna's example might be a particular member of that class or not and and whether Luca was in that sort of class that we predict is something that we have to be able to figure out um, using different approaches um, and so what we're hoping to do is be able to construct a class of models that are in the same universality class as modern biochemistry and see if those Luca models seem like they're consistent with what we know of early life from other people's reconstructions or how it can kind of co-constrain what was happening at that period. I'm sure Joanna has more to say from her side. But... Yeah, I agree. I think there is an important distinction to make here, which is what is LUCA and what is FUCA. LUCA is the last universal common ancestor, right? So commonly in evolutionary biology, that is seen as the last thing that had 
what we all shared. So Luca, in theory, in the common definition of evolutionary biology has the genetic code already because we all share it. So perhaps it would be more appropriate to talk about what me and Sarah are doing in terms of FUCA. I changed the concept for the slide today. Um, so the first universal common ancestor and what's before what we all share now uh, is much different and a much bigger unknown. Um, I, I tend to believe that it involved some universal molecules that are already that we share as well. Uh, probably not the code, but I'm looking forward to see more work in terms of different molecules and different possible pathways is what Sarah and Lee are exploring. Yeah, and I, I think some of our work can can kind of um, corroborate what you're saying, Joanna, because I, I didn't show this stuff, but we always see you have a higher universality in compounds used across all modern life than you do reactions, than you do re enzyme functions. So there's sort of a hierarchy of universality too, which people don't usually talk about. Absolutely. Uh, and it also depends if you're talking about universality across individual organisms or universality across ecosystems. And I personally tend to think of LUCA as an ecosystem level property, not an individual. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of other people have worked on that and suggested that, including Nigel that's going to talk tomorrow, has worked quite a lot on that set of ideas. Um, so I, th I think we just have to be very careful what we're talking about. And I think the way I think about it is much more similar to what Joanna was saying. It's the first sort of organized chemistry we had that we could call life that has some ancestry today um, in terms of what biochemical reactions were happening. Um, and that's what we're trying to reconstruct. Yeah, this hierarchy is very clear. Even when you go from molecules to reactions to genes, in terms of genes, when we started sequencing more and more genomes, we saw, wow, it's almost nothing is conserved. Like we have uh, shared function, but what encodes for that is very non-orthologous, non-universal. So that universality is, the hierarchy is, is very clear. Okay. Um. Well, I guess I, I was just uh, uh, trying to emphasize that all pa all speakers are on the panel discussion. So, are there anyone? Uh, is there anyone who would like to chip in from from the speaker list? Um. So while, while speakers think of a question, um, I'm going back to the first question from the Q&A and it's quite interesting. It's a, a theoretical question and it's related to, I think, Gödel's work, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, I suppose, and strong emergence. I'm not an expert now, but, but I guess it says something that you um, said you can't that you can't uh, calculate everything, right? So it's sort of axiomatic um, uh, ingredients which you can't prove. So um, I guess if I understand this correctly, if it are, Applied to the origin of life, we might be in a in a in a in a pro we have, might encounter problems that we that we that we that we have to take it as a given. We can't compute it essentially. We can't um, predict it. I, I don't know if I understood this question correctly, but if there's any other theorist or well, jo jo Joanna uh, put that out on her slide, so I guess jo Joanna may may want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I burned myself. Why did I do this? I'm not a mathematician or a philosopher, but um, yes, this is an argument that is made. I don't think there is a clear proof of strong emergence in, in Godel's work uh, for many reasons, but uh, Godel's statements, so the ones that uh, have to, that have to be inserted in, in a theory independently of its axioms, their existence means that the, the theory is not sufficiently explanatory without uh, external axioms that will never be uh, predictable from within the theory. So in a very formal way, I think there is some kind of relation, uh, but I'm not a philosopher or a mathematician, so I, I would not know if that is proof. I hope someone can help me out here. I, I just uh, a quick comment on it, just building out what Joanna was saying. Um, a key feature is you have to describe the system from outside itself to see any of the issues, right? So just like like um, you know, if you have a Turing machine, 
you you can't predict if a program is going to halt. But if you put that Turing machine in the program into another Turing machine, then you can talk about properties of that system together. But that Turing, the Turing machine you put them in, you won't know if it'll halt on that program, right? So you can always describe a system completely from the outside, but you can't describe it internally because it doesn't have all the information about itself. Um, and so, um, so I think there's a couple places where people talk about this being relevant to physics of life because life looks like it's a self-referential system. Um, and you might have state dependent dynamics in the way that a Turing machine has state dependent dynamics, um, that the rules actually depend on the state of the machine and the state of the tape. Um, and that's very different than the way we talk about dynamical systems in physics because it doesn't depend on the state of the machine. It just depends on the law, which, you know, is, well, it kind of does, but in a really trivial way. Um, and Nigel would be, you know, I see he's turned his camera on, so he should be talking about this. Um, but um, but I, I, I think also some of these issues arise because of the way that we write down the laws of physics as they exist now, and they're not they're not consistent with talking about self-referential features or state dependent dynamical laws. Um, and so some of us here have worked on those kind of features. I'm going to pass to Nigel because I really want to hear what he's going to Thank say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the, the, the really interesting uh, session. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here because I heard the discussion was veering in the direction that I'll cover a little bit in my talk tomorrow, but only very quickly, of course. But um, I don't think I agree with the idea of emergence as being um, you know, something surprising that uh, comes out of a system or unexpected, because I think that just is a just, you know, feature of your ignorance. You could start off with a, a magnet and say, oh, wow, I cooled it down way. Yeah, I, I got I, I went from a power magnetic phase to a power, to a ferromagnetic phase. Who knew that would happen? Uh, but in fact, if you you know, you write down the correct uh, Hamiltonian and you do the correct statistical mechanics, you will indeed uh, be able to predict that. There is no surprise, but it is certainly uh, emergent because the emergent properties are the, you know, the emergent rigidity, the, the, uh, the spin wave stiffness and other properties that characterize the collective order that arises from local interactions. So, so I would differ from the, 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 characterization of emergence as being something surprising and, and sort of not put into the, into the theory. Now, when we, as, as Sarah said, when we get to um, evolution, uh, you know, there's this notion of self-referentiality and uh, I, I don't know who was the first people to, to talk about that. It, it, certainly we, Carl Woese and I uh, wrote a, a lot about it uh, about 10 or more uh, years ago, um, but um, the, the idea is that what distinguishes physical and biological systems is that the biological systems essentially can change the rules by which they they operate and the rules by which they change those rules are themselves subject to change because they're biological laws as Sarah said and so you get this infinite regress and and where the connection to Gödel's theorem comes in is that you if you know the state of a system now you can't predict the state in the future not because you can't predict it but because you don't even know what the axes are of the phase of the phase space because it is generating new phase space, it is generating new emergent degrees of freedom that then have their own axes in the phase space. And so that's the reason why uh, I think you have this notion of perhaps uh, girdle undecidable in the dynamics of evolving systems. So I think one should distinguish physical and biological systems in the sense that the physical systems are a subset of biological systems. Biological systems are an exemplar of systems which, uh, which self-program themselves, and physical systems are exemplars of systems where the programming is, is already done and nothing active happens. And I think that's what uh, differentiates living systems from uh, purely physical boring systems that we study in, in physics departments. So does that, I don't know if that helps the discussion, but anyway, I thought I'd jump in and, and but, add but this. If I, if, if I can follow up on it, uh, so because of the sequence space is so large and you have so many diff, you know, different ways where to go, right? That's what you're saying that you have no, a lot of not, feedback it's possibilities. It's uh, actually, or, it's not because I don't think sequence space is adequate to okay. uh, describe evolving systems. In other words, the idea that if I just know the genotype, I know everything, I know the phenotype, that's completely wrong because uh, the, the emergence comes from the interaction between the, the, the living systems. In fact, I'll show this in my talk tomorrow, that when you try to understand the 
structure of, of, of phylogenetic trees, you actually need to understand something about the, the ecosystem dynamics, and that's a yeah. collective behavior. So I think, you know, I mean, certainly, I mean, I mean, when to I understand say, the, the emergence okay. of biomolecules, it's absolutely critical to think about sequence space. But if one is trying to think about the self referentiality and the open ended growth of complexity, which is what I thought we were, we were discussing here, um, then I think sequence space is not the right um, space to be using. I actually don't so know would you agree that, that it's is, maybe sequence so, space of all the molecules, you know, the, the cooperative sequence space with the boundaries or? The whole point about emergence is that when you have collective behavior, then you lose the connection to the uh, lower lying degrees of, of freedom, except through parameters that are, that in, at least in simple systems, come in as phenomena of constants uh, through ideas like renormalization group. So, so, so I think, Jesus, what the heck? <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> Throw it out the window. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will. Thank you, T-Mobile, for telling me that I paid my my phone bill. Um, so, so, so I think you know you could look at the microscopic configurations of a, of a ferromagnet and look at all the spin system as a spin system, but that won't tell you very much about, about how a spin wave is propagating through the system. And that's really the that, that's the point. You have to talk. The whole point about emergence is you have to talk about the level of description of the objects that are created, the macroscopic objects, and then you basically lose the connection to the microscopic degrees of freedom. In my example of, say, the ferromagnet, all that happens is everything that's happening in the between the spins and their configurations and the you know the the way that they interact through exchange interactions and from quantum mechanics, all of that just gets bundled in to the uh, coefficient in, in the in the uh, spin wave stiffness. So so you so that's how you can get universal <laughs> descriptions of systems. But there's the flip side of that is that you cut the connection to the microscopic degrees of freedom, so you don't see them anymore, except through certain uh, renormalized parameters. But, but the mechanism of Gödel is a little bit a different thing, right? I, I mean that that's, that's, a that's, that, 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 that 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 is a, that is a, that is a different thing. I I I agree with you. But so okay, so we have two reasons why it's very hard to go down to the origin of life to be, to uh, explain it, either Gödel or emergence, which makes it really hard to understand the lower levels, I suppose. But but um, Udo just joins a call. Um, well, I, I don't know that Gödel yeah. help, helps us understand the origin of life. I, I wouldn't say that at all. I, 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 I don't even know if it's true. But I think, it, and I'm not the only person who's thought about Gödel's theorem. That there's other people who have as well. But I think the I, I think what, what one's talking about the emergence of life as opposed to the origin of life. One is talking about what are the generic universal processes that the emergence of life on Earth is, a, is an example of, and that would presumably govern the emergence of life on, say, in the global oceans of liquid water underneath the ice caps of Enceladus or Europa, for example. Mm. I also just can point out briefly that most of these issues arise because of the way we write laws of physics with an initial state and a fixed law of motion. And so some of these problems are just because of the way we structure physical theories. And if we have a different way of building those theories, they might not have the same problems that physics has and why physics looks different than biology, because there's an underlying theory that doesn't have those constraints on it. Um, yeah. OK. Um, hey, uh, in, in, in interest of the, of the time, uh, I think we, we, we break here and um, Take a we are sort of a little bit over time, so we take maybe a very short break, three minutes, two, three minutes, and then we continue with the next session. So I wanted to thank again all the speakers and all the people contributing to the discussion, and we see you in a couple minutes. Cool.
Sir, you are now on live. Can you see the slide? I can see it. OK, so welcome back, everyone, after the short break. Uh, we continue with the next session, and Sarah will introduce the speakers. Yeah, Robert, are you able to pull up the slide for the second set of speakers? Am I sharing my slide? Um, yeah, we have the no, slide just introducing the speakers. Sorry. My computer is very slow, so I could load it, but it might take five minutes. Yeah, I, I wanted to show the, the, the slide to introduce the next session. Yes. Um, so, Sarah, um, do you want to quickly introduce the speakers? Sure, I can I can do that. I'll just see if I can share my slides because it's just very slow on my end. Sorry. Um, I, so, I'm showing the slide right now, Sarah. Oh, so no, sure. Robert, oh, you see, haven't shared the slide yet. We don't have your slide yet, Robert. Can you share it again, please? Well, while we're pulling up the slide, just so we don't delay further, I can start introducing our next set of speakers and that slide should appear in a moment. So hi everyone, welcome um, to our second session, uh, which is called Defying the Second Law of Thermodynamics. So I suspect we'll um, find a little bit about what that provocative title means in a few minutes. Um, we have three excellent speakers um, lined up for the session that are going to give talks live um, and also a fourth speaker um, that had a video sent out um, earlier today. So I'll, I'll go through and introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker for this session is going to be um, uh, Suzanne, uh, sorry, Udo Seifert. Um, and uh, you, um, who is a um, professor of theoretical physics at the University of Stuttgart um, and is really a leader in the field of stochastic thermodynamics. Um, and then next up we have Jeremy England, um, who's going to be talking about uh, self-organization of lifelike behaviors and their properties. Um, and has really been leading a lot of efforts about trying to understand um, from thermodynamic principles um, the emergence of lifelike properties. And then we have Pablo Satari, who um, will talk about um, stochastic thermodynamics and bioenergetics um, and uh, has some very exciting things to say there. And then the talk that we have um, recording for you um, is uh, Suzanne Still's talk. Um, so please uh, keep an eye out for that. And then we'll have the panel discussion afterwards. So I'm going to pass over. Um, oh, here, the slide finally came up. Uh, to our first speaker, Udo Seifert, and that should. So it'll just take a second to switch over. So Udo, you should be able to share your slides now. Um, he might have left briefly to rejoin. Oh, I oh. see. I see him on here. No access. Um, so Udo doesn't seem to have access anymore. OK, he's coming back. Hey, Udo, glad you could join. You're still muted. OK, we, we had a crash here, so I missed the introduction. Am I supposed to start? Yes. OK, good. Oh, fine, you're introduced. As well as here. Uh, okay. Good. So, can you see that, Robert? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, thank you very much for inviting me, Robert, and the other organizers as well, and inviting me despite the fact that I'm not working at the origin of life. 
So I thought what I will do today, and you see it in the somewhat cautiously formulated title, that I would like to highlight a few insights from stochastic thermodynamics, which may be relevant, hopefully, uh, to the origin of life or in the early stages of life. So what is stochastic thermodynamics about? It's basically summarized here in this slide, the basic philosophy. Um, so we are trying to understand and to explore whether and how the rules which have been developed to understand steam engines, i.e. the different ways how to transform energies into each other, whether and how these laws can be applied to much more smaller engines, uh, molecular motors, here you see this F1 ATPase, where due to experimental progress over the last 20 years, one can observe single 120 degree steps when this gamma purple uh, subunit uh, turns around. So the question is whether the thermodynamic laws which have been developed on the left can be applied to systems on the right. That's what we're basically trying to understand in, in stochastic thermodynamics. And the um, community has made uh, quite some progress and I want to highlight uh, a few of, of this progress, and then uh, perhaps we can discuss later in which sense this is relevant to the uh, theme of the um, conference today. Okay, so my first point is, um, in aqueous solution and under non-equilibrium conditions, temperature and chemical potential of small molecules, let's say like ATP or phosphate, is are locally well-defined and these values for temperature and chemical potential, they will enter kinetic constraints. So um, if you have an enzyme like this green one, which has different conformations or different states, and which interacts uh, with substrate molecules like ATP or ADP or phosphate, with chemical reactions like this one here. And the point is that in each of these different states of the enzyme, you can associate a free energy. And depending on the concentration of these molecules, you can associate a chemical difference, uh, for instance, for this type of, of catalyzed reaction. And then one of the insights is that uh, there is kinetics, yes, but this kinetics is constrained by the fact that the log ratio of the rates typically has to obey these kind of thermodynamic constraints. And then we have also learned that if we look at such a single reaction in a solution, that um, we can identify a first law for such systems. Uh, in this case, for instance, if the enzyme goes from N to M, uh, the internal energy changes, the energy of the surrounding solution changes, and there is some contribution to heat. And we also have expressions for the uh, entropy production in such a situation. So when we look at the current of going from N to M, um, the total entropy production is the sum over all these currents. And using that constraint, and only by using that constraint, you can show that this uh, free, uh, entropy production is, is, is positive. And this holds not only for a, a single uh, reaction event or single enzyme, you can build uh, this kind of theory for whole biochemical reaction networks, and I guess it could be applied to some of the systems uh, we have seen in the, in the previous talks. Okay, so um, certainly these are not equilibrium systems because, for instance, the ATP reaction is not in equilibrium, but uh, there are constraints, you cannot choose any rates you want. Um, second point is fluctuations in these small systems are typically non-Gaussian. Even rare fluctuations are thermodynamically constrained. The initial distribution matters. So um, it's an essential tool is to um, consider entropy, total entropy production as a quantitative measure of broken time reversal symmetry. So if you have any trajectory x of t in some space, you look at the time reverse trajectory and then the total entropy production along such a trajectory is given by the log ratio of the probability of observing this trajectory compared to the probability of observing the time reverse trajectory. And with this definition, once you have that, it's easy to derive 
fluctuation theorems like this one, which tells you that e to the minus total entropy production averaged will be always one. And from this by Jensen, you get the second law. Um, the key point is this is true for any initial distribution. You don't have to start in equilibrium or in a non-equilibrium steady state. It's true for any duration of the experiment. However, there's an important constraint which I want to highlight. Each microstate, for that to be true, each microstate must have an initially a non-zero probability. And if that's not the case, you get different uh, laws or relations. And somewhat provocatively, um, I have sketched here one. So uh, at the left hand side, we have time equal to zero. And I've partitioned all microstates, let's say in a test tube or in some bigger aquarium or whatever, into the set of dead microstate and the potential set of living ones. However, at initial time t equal to zero, all probability is in the dead space. And then there's a certain probability for the living states to emerge after time t, and there's a probability for them to survive after time 2t. And the relation which you then get is that e to the minus total entropy production under the condition that this red uh, trajectory happened, that emergence has happened, is for instance one minus the survival probability to go from living at time t to living at time 2t. And then by Jensen, you get for instance that the total entropy production along this red emergence is, will be larger than the log one over one minus survival probability. So if the survival probability is very large, then the mean entropy production had to be substantially positive, stronger than the second law. And I guess we'll hear more on this in um, Jeremy's talk later. Um, these integral relations are typically just one constraint on what can happen. And for certain situations, like in a non-equilibrium steady state, there are stronger constraints, like the detailed fluctuation theorem, which constrains the whole probability distribution. But the warning is, and the important point is, again, you have to start in the non-equilibrium steady state, otherwise you can't use a relation like this for entropy production. And just as a brief illustration for the fact that fluctuations are non-Gaussian, I mean, this is not a living system, but it's a small driven system out of equilibrium of particle driven across the periodic potential. And here you see distributions which are very much non-Gaussian, still they obey this red box. Uh, a second insight, perhaps more important, is precision doesn't come for free. Uh, we had already in Robert's talk um, the reminder on a Hopfield and Nino theory of uh, copying with templates and the fact that the equilibrium discrimination wouldn't be quite enough and that at expense of a non-equilibrium reaction, you can get essentially the square of this, of this error rate. Now, I want to uh, introduce you to not this type of uh, precision in copying, but on what you could call temporal precision. So, um, suppose you ask uh, the following question, and I want to motivate it with the present day situation, not with the origin of life. Suppose you want to run this watch, and you want to run it at finite temperature, so it's clear that there will be fluctuations and the watch will not be infinitely precise. So the question is, does a more precise clock need more energy from its battery? And the answer is yes. And if you want to get numbers, for instance, if you want to measure the length of a day with a precision of one second, we now understand that the cost of that measurement is will be at least 10 to the minus a joule, i.e. at room temperature, i.e. Uh, two times 10 to the 10 kVT. So how do we get uh, this kind of result? Well, uh, we built a simple clock, and the simplest one is the asymmetric random walk. So each step of the hand of such a clock will involve the, let's say, hydrolysis of, of ATP. And then you just apply the rules uh, of the random walk. I don't have to go through this here in detail. What you then find is that what we call the uncertainty, which is defined as the variance of, let's say, after one minute, 
you typically 160 steps, but sometimes you've got 58, sometimes 62, which leads to this uncertainty. Um, this uncertainty should be small, but there will be a cost associated with it. The cost is the entropy production times the time. And we know from stochastic thermodynamics that the entropy production for a single step is the log ratio of going to the right versus going to the left. And this log ratio, again, is associated with the free energy difference, associated with the process that drives the system to the right, that drives the clock. And when you combine these relations, you find that the, clock, the cost times the uncertainty squared is larger than 2 kPG. Now, this would be uh, just a curiosity, but um, we saw in simulating much larger systems, different networks, looking at limiting cases, that um, this relation is true for any process which can be based on a stationary Markov process, and that was later proven by uh, Todd Gingrich and Jeremy England and co-workers. So you could call this the inevitable universal cost of any precise process of temporal precision, or more technically, for any current in such a network, and current is something which is odd under time reversal, and you can associate a weight with each link, uh, you find this little red box. The total entropy production in the system is larger than the current squared divided by the fluctuations of the current. dJ is the diffusion coefficient, which is a signature of the fluctuations of such a current. And that's uh, now known to be a universal uh, relation. And this has a consequences. Um, and I want to formulate this consequence in the following way. Any molecular machine is subject to a trade-off between three criteria, between efficiency, between power, and reliability, i.e. small fluctuations. Uh, this is true under non-equilibrium steady state conditions. If you have external periodic driving, these constraints uh, can be alleviated. And again, I, I want to illustrate it with a biological uh, system, a molecular motor kinesine running um, along this microtubule and running against an externally imposed force, which is, is exerted uh, by a laser trap that acts on the bead, which is attached to the molecule. Now this here, what you can measure then is the velocity. You can measure the fluctuations in the velocity, which is called the fusion coefficient. And that's typically, uh, the ratio is typically quoted, and these are experimental data from Block School from 20 years ago, as a function of the load at a certain ATP concentration. Now, you, you take this data and you combine it with the uncertainty relation, you find a really interesting um, result on the efficiency of such a machine. So the thermodynamic efficiency is given by the power output divided by the input, Power is velocity against the force. The input is not known. That's the key point. You do not know how many ATPs the motor needs for a step. But we know that the input is the output plus the dissipation. And for the dissipation, we have the inequality. So you see that the efficiency of the motor is constrained by a, a ratio here, which involves only experimentally measurable quantities. And taking the same data now and overlaying this curve, if you take this data point where the motor runs against a two piconewton load, we find from our theory that given this measured fluctuations and the measured velocity, the motor here, this is 45% line, the orange line, the motor is at most 45% efficient in transforming chemical energy into uh, mechanical motion. And that holds us without assuming any specific model of the motor, just given the experimental conditions. And the trade-off I was alluding to is essentially the same relation formulated in a different way. The power of any such machine is constrained by the distance the efficiency has to the maximum value one. These are all isothermal machines, so the utmost at the highest efficiency is one. So as you approach this upper limit, the power typically vanishes, but there's a prefactor which are the fluctuations. Now, when you have additional periodic driving from the, from the external uh, agent like the sun, 
periodic driving 24 hour cycle, for instance, uh, you get an additional factory, which is this green one, which can become uh, quite small. And in this case, for this external periodic driving, there is the option of dissipation less precision. So in that case, in sense, the external environment um, pays for this precision and the system itself doesn't have to, um, to pay. So with this, I want to close. And I guess the big question is in which sense these relations, which are uh, true in the framework I described, in which sense these relations are helpful uh, for understanding the key questions uh, this conference is about. So thanks so much. Happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you for the wonderful talk. That was uh, really um, quite intriguing. We don't have any questions um, in the chat right now, but I actually do have a question since you're talking about um, efficiency and time scales. There's always this critical question in origins of life about how long the process takes, right? Because the origins of life seem to happen very quickly. I mean, at least on geological time scales, not necessarily chemical time scales. Um, do you see any promise for some of the things that you've been talking about in bounding um, sort of how efficient the first systems needed to be or what the time scales worth for the process or these kind of things? Well, I mean, the theory is certainly so far, in a sense, is made for specific molecular machines like motors or perhaps the uh, ribosomes or uh, whatever. So whether it can apl be applied to that big system which mm -hmm. generates life at the first time, I think that's that's a different story. Right. So I see it. I, 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 a more immediate applicability is, is perhaps looking at systems um, Peter will, will explore at some point. Um, I wouldn't quite dare to uh, apply it to a process which, which runs over a considerable long time, where of course external conditions may also change, right? So most of what I said applies to steady state conditions. And I imagine, you know, for many processes, um, I mean, we are in fact in steady state conditions, right? In our cells, we are in non-equilibrium, but we have 37 degrees of temperature. We have a typical delta mu for the ATP hydrolysis of 20 kBT. So that, that was my first point. I mean, despite the fact that we are in equilibrium and perhaps slightly um, disagreeing with what Dieter said, we, we do have a theory, a physics uh, a theory for non-equilibrium for a certain type of non-equilibrium. Non-equilibrium in aqueous solution, certain concentrations of these small molecules, and then the big ones. The big ones are subject uh, to these constraints. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, Udo, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, ju just to you know follow up a bit. Um, you know what what we find quite interesting is if you have you know longer strands 12 morons of rna dna all kind of sequences if you you know make it thermally oscillate between two points uh they they are they're having a hard time to to be in equilibrium you know they're always kinetically you dissociate them they try to find themselves and always so i was wondering how much you know Defined temperature, all very well defined. You know how much of your theory could be applied to that? Because it would be interesting to see, you know, which sequences, which classes can actually meet under these non-equilibrium thermocycling in a very efficient way. Because they will drive the evolution of this pool of of yeah. of, of yeah. polymers. I mean, this, if I understand, I mean, this is a periodic steady state, right? You cycle, yes. this, you cycle the temperature, and that's the next class in complexity compared to steady states. But all of this is perfectly applicable. The key point is that then the rates become time dependent as well in a periodic fashion because of the temperature sure, cycles. Sure, yeah. But you know, I think this, you know the the on rate is more or less. Yeah, the on rate is more or less same. Off rates, you know, change. But but then it's kind of. I was just wondering how much how much complexity you could think of. You know, if they they start to ligate and and. Uh, you know, the funny story is if for, for those 12 mirrors, if you have all the four bases, you can run that. And if you don't give it enough time at the cold temperatures, mm -hmm. they just don't find each other. So clearly yeah. they are not in 
they're not equilibrated, but if some sequences, you know, run the game and, and can find themselves because they have whatever on rate advantage or they will completely, you know, exponentially grow out of that system. So even such a very simple thing could show very interesting uh, dynamics. Yeah. yeah. No, so, I, it would be worth exploring, certainly, Dieter, yes. Yeah. We have a few more questions in the chat. I'm just going to ask one really quick one before we move to our next speaker, um, and then we can get to the other questions in the panel discussion. Um, this one should be very quick, which was just which paper, um, if you can restate how the derivation relating entropy generation to of emergence to survival um, that you had. Oh, I made I made this catch uh, when I prepared the talk, but uh, Jeremy certainly has a more sophisticated yeah. version of this, and it's his paper in J. Kempfis 2013. So this is a perfect segue then to our next talk. Um, so at that, with that, I'm going to uh, segue into introducing Jeremy. So um, Udo, I still see your slide on my screen, so maybe if oh, you can stop sorry. sharing and then we'll get uh, Jeremy okay. up to uh, share. And see. thanks again, that was fantastic. I'm looking yeah, thank you. Um, can you kill the sharing because yeah. we have kill, it. Just kill the sharing. OK, and Jeremy, are you ready? Somehow we can hear you. OK, good. We can hear you. I think I, I, I clicked on what I thought was on mute and then it somehow minimized the window. So I was trying to get it back. But, <laughs> and it also looked well, it was very tiny, like it was still muted. So I didn't realize I could be heard. I'm glad I didn't curse more loudly. Um, so uh, now I will try again to share my screen. All right, so on the desktop. And now I am sharing my desktop. Are you able to see the slides yet? Yes. Excellent. Um, great. So I'm going to skip over this part to save on time a little bit. Um, so let's start off with this idea. When we think about the organization of living things and we say that we think that they are well adapted to their environment and that they are somehow architecturally impressive in what they accomplish in relationship to their environment. It's easiest for us to think of that in biological terms, meaning or, or let's say to be generous biochemical terms that there are things that need to happen in order to help a living thing to survive and reproduce. And if they can't happen, then things die. And so adaptation and, and selection and all of that good stuff is coming from the question of whether the structure of the living system is well suited to the state of the environment in such a way that it can persist there and maybe make copies of itself. So if we have a bacterium, for example, we could ask whether it is able to metabolize sugars in its environment. It's gonna break down these sugars and make the enzymatic wheels turn and, and run things like clocks, like Udo was referring to, in the right direction and do the, all the detailed balance breaking that requires that fueling. And if you aren't able to break down the sugar in the environment, then it may as well be for your, you know, from your perspective, like there's no food there at all. And, and what's interesting, I think in the biological example, we readily appreciate that, of course, if you mutate the genome of this bacterium, you might destroy its ability to metabolize some food because the enzyme is going to be different and it's, it's not going to work. And we think of that in terms of change in genotype and change in phenotype. But you could also just think of it as a change in, in physical state or physical composition, right? That I have a bunch of atoms, I can put them together in different ways and I could make one kind of bacterium out of it or another kind of bacterium out of the same building blocks. And, and that's a much more radical kind of reorganization of the matter than just changing something in the genome. Um, but similarly, if I, it, it's sort of obvious or trivial to say, if I took the atoms of the living thing and I randomly rearranged those constituent parts, then I wouldn't typically get something that was as good at catalyzing the breakdown of a particular sugar that's in the, in the environment or, or whatever other kind of interaction or relationship I'm, I'm interested in. And that points to, I think, something basic about our notion of function and functional success and the relationship between structure and function, which is that whenever we see something is good at something, we're implicitly comparing it 
to a random rearrangement of its constituent parts. Because if it weren't better at doing whatever the thing is that we're interested in, then the random arrangement, then it's hard to say that it has function or that it has form that begets function because random things would, are, are not distinguishable. So that's all very well and good for biological systems. And, and I think the point now is to try to think, what does it mean to generalize this? Um, uh, and this gets back to a point that, that I was struck by um, hearing Joanna's talk earlier, that if you have just a bunch of chemicals that have different concentrations, uh, and you're not going to ask the question, you know, what is special about the distribution in chemical space that I'm observing? You need some kind of uh, talisman in the environment to sort of compare to. It, to the degree that you can talk about a particular ability or a particular relationship to the environment that that matter has, now you can start saying, well, now let me compare the state that I observe to perhaps random other arrangements or uh, an arrangement I would take from some null distribution like you know thermal equilibrium. And, and you start to be able to notice the exceptionality of the particular arrangements or ensemble of arrangements um, that, that you're able to observe. And I, to me, I think that's the essence of the starting point of, of saying, how do we understand the emergence of life like this? We should be thinking about what is life good at with respect to its environment, and it's a list of things. And given that it's good at those things, what can we now say about how matter might end up becoming exceptionally organized in that kind of a relationship? Um, and I'll, I'll just mention, you know, there are different kinds of things that living things are good at. Um, they, they persist, meaning they don't fall apart once they form. That sounds trivial, but it you know shouldn't be totally trivial uh, thermodynamically speaking because it's all from fluctuations, right? They self-replicate, they harvest energy, they tell time like Udo was discussing, they make predictions about their surroundings and act out those predictions. So life is this big semantic bundle of different things that connote uh, the, the idea of life together and on their own they maybe are, are more primitive things that we can build physical models of. So that's the, the program that I would recommend is, is dividing and conquering and saying, Let's think about the different things that living things are good at, and let's try to make physical theories of how they might get good at them, how, how humps of naive matter might get good at those things, um, and then maybe we'll make some progress in understanding uh, how, how life-like emergence uh, converges from different factors uh, of life-likeness that maybe have separate ways of getting going. So one of the things I've tried to argue for and how to approach thinking about this um, is, is what we call dissipative adaptation. And this really is, is a very high level argument just from an algebraic rearrangement of, of uh, an equation uh, that also appeared in Udo slides that in stochastic thermodynamics, we have this idea that entropy production in the surroundings is what allows you to break time reversal symmetry. And, and so you get that from the Crookes relation. And if you just do a little bit of uh, rearranging things, you can write down a generalization of the forward Boltzmann distribution for a non-equilibrium process using that same kind of expression. And you can see you still, ha you still have a Boltzmann weight telling you whether J or K is more likely, and it has to do with their relative energy. But also there are other things that are very non-equilibrium, like kinetic factors. You know, this middle factor here is about kinetic accessibility. And the last factor on the right is about the extra entropy production you're doing essentially, the, the work absorption from the surroundings on the way to your destination. And I, the point I try to make here is that the same way that the fact that ice exists is something that we connect very intuitively to the notion that lowering your energy is going to make you more probable in the Boltzmann distribution, uh, we could also ask about other factors in this equation and whether there are other kinds of organization that the explanation for why they're possible comes not from the lowering of energy, but instead, for example, from the work history, from the idea that on the way to where you're going, you absorbed a lot of extra work from the environment. And I'll point out that just because ice exists and can exist doesn't mean that lowering your energy is always what you do. You can't predict the outcome of any system by just saying, well, the Boltzmann distribution says low energy is more probable, so you always are in some crystalline state. That's not true. Nonetheless, the fact that that weight is on the scale implies the existence of forms of organization that end up extremizing that factor. And I, I think what's really exciting is to now look at forms of organization that might end up extremizing the other factor. If I think about a collection of matter, the environment that it's in, and the work that that environment could do on it, what is going to be the argument for why I might end up in a state of organization that reflects the work history aspect of, of this 
um, uh, overall term governing the likelihood of outcomes. When is it going to be the case that the history of how much energy I absorbed along my way to where I'm going um, is kind of the reason I'm there? And I think the, the, the particularly important point here is, as we know, you have situations in which it's clear that the shape or the state of the system is going to control the access of the system to energy from a fixed environment. So I have a non-equilibrium drive with a certain frequency, and if, it, if I'm in a particular shape, uh, then uh, that shape might resonate a lot and absorb a lot of energy. Or if I take the same matter and reshape it, then I might resonate less and absorb less energy. And that could have very consequential uh, impact on the eventual state of organization of the system, right? Because I might shatter the glass in one case and not shatter it in another case. So this is the ultimate feedback loop that we have to close when thinking about this. The flow of energy is both the reason you change your shape in a non-equilibrium dynamics, and also it is something that's controlled by your shape. So if I have matter that's in some state, and the state that I'm in controls my access to external drives, and then also my access to those external drives impacts the way that I change my state, and then I keep on doing that, I close that loop and I iterate, what I'm gonna get is a biased exploration of the space of possible configurations, and I, I see the potential then for the pattern of the particular ways the system, the environment is capable of pushing on the system to be written into the eventual states towards which the system gets biased, right? So it's about the emergence of a fine-tuned matching relationship between the state of the system and the particular pattern of the environment. And so it's a, a, a sort of input, output, or a response property kind of evolution uh, that can be a generalized form of selection that you could look for even in cases where you don't have self-copying things where that's the underlying mechanism for how such a relationship could emerge. Um, so, sorry, my slide is further than for a second. Um, did I jump over one or, okay, sorry, there we go. So I just wanna briefly mention two examples where you see this kind of behavior. And I think that what they point to is the broader potential either in non-equilibrium many chemical high dimensional spaces or in active matter um, for, for there to be new kinds of experiments we could do uh, if, we, if we take the right sort of lessons uh, from these simple examples. They're both examples of systems where you have multiple degrees of freedom. It's kind of a many body system. There's some quench disorder in how different pieces interact. There's nonlinearity. So you have this kind of rugged landscape of something to explore. Um, and, and then you're going to have a pattern in the way the system is being driven. Maybe it's a frequency, maybe it's some other more complicated uh, predictability in how the system is being poked. In this case, this is a, a mechanical network where you just have masses in two dimensions with short bonds, uh, or rather I should say bonds that either like to be short or long. They're just bistable, but they can't break. And which masses are bonded to which is quench disorder. And I take one of these masses and I just wiggle it with some chosen frequency and amplitude and direction. And what's interesting is that at short times, what the system does is it kind of thermalizes the energy it absorbs. So it's nonlinear, it's many body. There's a lot of chaotic things that you could imagine start to happen as you start pushing on the system enough to jump over barriers. And so at short times, the system just looks like it's kind of heating up and absorbing the energy and doing very random things. And then at long times, the rate of work absorption settles down. The drive hasn't changed, but the system stops absorbing as much work, and it's kind of stuck now. In fact, without thermal noise, uh, if you just had Newtonian mechanics with drag, this would be an absorbing attractor, a, a closed orbit um, in, in uh, phase space, where uh, the, the system is basically finding a particular combination of short and long bonds whose local response properties are well matched to the drive, so that the work that is absorbed doesn't end up rearranging you further. So it's a highly exceptional state. And the way that you can tell that is if you just change the drive, then you get something new. So here we're just switching between oscillating the drive at fixed amplitude and frequency, and then instead oscillating the driven particle at fixed positional amplitude and frequency is in instead of forcing amplitude. So you just go back and forth, and every time you change the drive, the system jumps back up in work absorption, rearranges, finds a new stable arrangement that has a sort of phenotype or a collective behavior that's well matched to the pattern of driving, and then it settles down again and is sort of stuck there. Um, what's interesting uh, is that you're in one case reducing resonance because when force amplitude is being fixed, then you want to resonate less. In the other case, 
you're coupling your slack modes to the driven particle so that they're not as stiff and less work gets done uh, as you move the driven particle back and forth. So it's actually in terms of response properties, quite global rearrangements uh, of what the system is doing. Um, and, and the other thing I'll mention, I always give these slides out of order, um, is, is that you really should think of it as being kind of like the difference between genotypic and phenotypic change, because every time you do that simulation, you get a different state that is well adapted or fine tuned to the drive, and it's adapted in the same way. The work absorption has gone down, uh, but the, the bonds are different in terms of which ones are short and long. The hamming distance of that whole ensemble diverges over time and then sort of plateaus when they all reach their different stable states. So you get to explore a high dimensional space of behavioral possibility, and there's lots of different microscopic ways that you could choose to have the same phenotypic or collective behavior um, that ends up being adapted or matched to the environment. Um, and, I, and I like to show a movie of, of this one because it's kind of a, a particularly fun example. It's a little bit cherry picked, um, but it, it just gives you a sense of what happens. I start wiggling the particle. I have this random network. First, the energy, energy kind of thermalizes and things randomly jumble around. Um, and then eventually I end up at later times in this state that's much more stable and can't be rearranged by this drive anymore. But what's interesting is actually on a longer time scale, it's doing this kind of motor duty cycle where the energy being absorbed by the driven particle is pumping some of the free degrees of freedom around in a circle that breaks detailed balance. Uh, and so you didn't select for that particular behavior deliberately, but just from the fact that you have a driven system that's settling and reducing the flexibility of many of its degrees of freedom, some of the remaining free ones end up getting pumped in these detailed balance breaking ways. And so it's not actually so difficult to make a very primitive looking motor by accident. Um, so sorry, these slides are transitioning a little bit slowly. Um, so I'll skip over this. Um, um, or I, you know, maybe we could come back to it if people have questions about it. But there's a there's a general framework in which you can think about why you think models like this should apply uh, or behaviors like this should pop up in a lot of different kinds of systems. Um, uh, and if people are curious, we can return to it. I just want to mention our most recent paper that, that came out in this topic area was the first experimental test of these ideas. Um, and, and the idea was to try to look at this in a swarm robotic setting. So what you do is you say, let me try to predict the relationship, or let me try to predict the steady state probability of a given configuration of the system. And the way that I do that is by looking at how work being absorbed from drive is giving rise to random motion. And the idea being that the more that the work you absorb causes randomizing motion, the more you're going to kind of diffuse away and try out a new state. But if you find a state that has a kind of fine tuned matching of response properties to that drive so that you stay in some orderly subset of arrangements rather than getting randomized and knocked around um, in chaos by the drive, then you're going to dwell there for longer. And so at long times, you end up being able to look at this local response property for how driving is transduced into motion and you can predict the steady state behavior at long times. Um, and excitingly, um, you can do this in an experimental setting with robots that were developed in, in the lab of Dan Goldman at Georgia Tech that are called Smarticles. What's cool about them is that they only move when they push on each other. Um, and, and so everything is very collective and very dynamical in terms of what kinds of uh, self-organization you can see. Uh, and if you, if you take these and put them in a ring, um, then they can do these very organized dances in, in ways that are kind of surprising with these rare chaotic flights in between the stable attractor dances. So this dance that it now got into is, is pretty stable and it will do this for a while. Um, and then let's see, does it go into something else eventually? So it does it for a while and see now it found a different arrangement, um, but that one is, is going to be stable and it will hang out that way for a while. So uh, the, the question is, can you predict the behavior in general from looking at the local dynamics or the local response properties? And, and indeed, um, you can so that the steady state probability uh, is predicted well by this, this idea of rattling. That's how the, the driving is producing um, local randomizing motion, uh, both in terms of the amplitude of that motion and how random it is. Uh, and, and you also can even use this as a selection principle where you can say, let me combine different patterns of drives and actually pick out the states that have overlapping matching to that drive. So every drive you choose, it will be totally different states that are well matched to that drive. So if I combine two drives, I can say, let me pick out the states that matches to both of them, uh, and, and I can actually select for a very particular set of configurations. I, I think the ultimate point here is 
and, and this is something that we could study um, uh, uh, systematically, is that if your drive is quite random, then you can't have emergent order respond to it in the system. But if your drive has some kind of pattern to it, some kind of structure, some kind of lower entropy predictability to it, then it raises the possibility that there could be an emergent responsive low entropy in the steady state distribution. Um, and, and as a result, I think the, the argument we're making for how you can do new experiments in you know, many species chemistry or in active matter is to think about, can I create a pattern in how I'm influencing the system that has enough of a barcode, so to speak, that I will be able to recognize the specialness and the fine tunedness of what the system gives back to me in terms of its behavior. And I think that it might be the case that in a broad variety of systems where they're kind of quasi disordered and active and they have a lot of different dynamical states they might occupy in principle, that if we go in looking where we're giving special attention to the pattern that we've chosen and how we try to try to drive the system and then look at the matching in the response, that we may get new opportunities to see different kinds of organization emergent active matter, some of which may remind us of things that are on the path towards more lifelike behaviors. Um, and, and so uh, with that, I will uh, just close and, and thank a great many uh, brilliant people and, and uh, uh, collaborators who uh, helped to, to make some of this work possible and also um, sources of funding and support. Um, and lastly, I'll just mention, I, I wrote a book that came out for, for general audiences last year um, but actually, uh, I think it uh, is, is in another sense a letter to my scientific colleagues, just trying to sort of in one place explain a bunch of ideas that I think are are interesting in connection with this topic. So um, if anyone's interested, then these are uh, pieces of information that might help in, in, in chasing it down. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Sarah, you're muted. Yeah, once again. Can I just jump in and ask a question? So Jeremy, sure. you mentioned a Pico Sheen uh, on one of your slides and um, you know he in the 70s as you know he talked about the dissipative structures and you talk about the dissipative adaptation. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you know for the non-experts on the in the audience how would you how would you say what is what is the difference? So I guess he talked about linear thermodynamics. You are far from equilibrium and maybe mm -hmm. more biological. How would you? Yeah, it's a good point to call out because I think that so I'll say first what what commonality there is, and then um, uh, I think there's some very important things that are not in common that have to be underlined. So I think when you get structure away from equilibrium. Um, it, it can be the case that something uh, appears to be optimized as a result of the formation of that structure. And, and in general, you know, optimization is a great way of seeing the emergence of what you call structure because structure kind of requires order and, and low entropy and also usually is based on some notion of relationship, which, which might be the, the thing you're optimizing in a sense. Um, and so Prigogine, had this result of obtaining the on-cycle relations and, and demonstrating that in linear regime, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, that you have this reduction of the total rate of entry production as you relax to the steady state. And that may sound familiar uh, in connection with some of what I was talking about because there was this kind of falling rate of work absorption. I know of no rigorous connection between these ideas though, because we're talking about systems that are definitely in the very non-linear regime for which you can't motivate the idea of an overall fall in entropy production from the same kind of argument. Indeed, it's clearly the case that there are non-equilibrium systems that are far from equilibrium that are not governed by some kind of principle of uh, minimal entropy production at, in its average rate at the steady state. However, what's true uh, is that there's a subclass of far from equilibrium nonlinear systems where you still can argue why it might be the case that the system is going to have a tendency to extremize and, and even perhaps minimize its rate of work absorption over time. And so the commonality there is that the same way, you know, when you take any many body system and you say, let me do an optimum of some property that is a global result of the arrangement of all the pieces, um, I'll end up getting something that might look structured in some way. These are structures that 
emerge from a process that you can describe as having to do with work absorption and, and energy dissipation, but we shouldn't call them dissipative structures because it's, it's not trying to be in contact with the same formalism and the same theoretical motivation. Excellent, thank you, Jeremy. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. We do have a few questions that we might return to for you in the panel discussion, um, sure. but thanks, that was a really, really great talk. Um, so next up, um, I think if Jeremy can stop sharing his screen, our next speaker is Pablo Satari. And I just wanna point out that um, Pablo was asked on rather short notice to step in uh, to give a talk today. And we're really grateful um, for him to join us. Um, and also to remind our audience um, that Suzanne Still that was originally slated to speak um, in this slot um, has provided a recorded talk um, that we invite you all to watch um, in your time outside of the, the main session of the meeting. Um, and that will also be additional engaging material for us. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass over um, to Pablo. We're very excited um, that he's been able to join us today. So we're ready. Uh, thank you. Just give me a second because the computer is extremely slow with this uh, Teams. Yeah. Mm. Can you see this? Nice yeah, it's coming up. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I just hope it doesn't crash again. It already crashed three times. <laughs> so yeah, I was given short notice, and because of that, I won't be able to focus too much on the origin of life. But I would like to say a couple of things about um, the cellular thermodynamics. So this is a topic that I've worked on in the past, and I'm slowly getting back into and um, well, I'm going to sort of be the role of devil's advocate. Let's see what you think. I think a good place to start is by something that we all feel more or less comfortable with, which is uh, the, the success of thermodynamics. And I would argue that there are two main successes uh, in thermodynamics. I mean, I'm sure there are many, but the two that I like to highlight today. One of them is that it allows a low dimensional phenomenology of matter. OK, so idea of law is a good example of this. There um, simple models of phase transitions is another example. And today we like to think about this as a case of dimensional reduction, right? So we know Boltzmann entropy and, and we tend to think of um, these four dimensional descriptions using the statistical physics technology. However, the, the history was uh, very lengthy to get to these simple descriptions. It started, I mean, at least in the 1600s with works like one of um, Boyle, and this was so long ago that the single point was asked customers actually have to look at the exact fractions of the two columns to compare them, and even plotting data was not customary because uh, the cat had died uh, not too long ago, so it was not very standard, but if you plot today this, this data, you can get this plot on Wikipedia. It's uh, pretty astonishing how, how, how well the scaling behaves, right? so I think this is very good evidence that this low dimensional description is is um, one of the early successes. Later on, what what happened? Um, one of the things that happened is that these simple models were used as inspiration to quantify the limits of thermal processes, and this required a huge leap of abstraction that is sometimes taken a bit for granted today. Which is going from designs, intricate designs like this one from James Watt, the steam engine, to 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 the Carnot engine, right? so the description that Carnot made that we still find on textbooks today of so how a thermal engine should work. And after that, he developed the Carnot cycle. After that, in the same work, and soon after, we could formulate in, in a pretty good shape uh, the first and second law of thermodynamics, right? So, on the one hand, we have low-dimensional descriptions, so finding the right variables for for a set of systems. And on the other hand, we have um, actual thermodynamics, let's say, so quantifying limits of thermal processes. Now, how do we take this knowledge, inspiration from this knowledge, and bring it back to biology? So I think one, one approach is to take the spirit of thermodynamics. OK, so more than looking at the variables of thermodynamics or the identities of thermodynamics, just taking the spirit of low dimensional phenomenology of different cellular subsystems. So Udo talked briefly about an ATP synthase. It's one of the many instances of a protein assembly. So during my past research, I've been investigating what would be a good phenomenological description of 
self assembly, biological self assembly uh, in the cell. And when you do that, you will come up with strange variables, right? so things like the heterogeneity of assembly or protein loading, which are not as a standard as a thermodynamic variables. The other approach, um, which I worked more in the past, is actually applying the laws of thermodynamics to cellular systems. Okay, so for instance, you have an ATP synthase and it's a rotary motor, and uh, you can describe it as a discrete, in a discrete state space and then calculate something like the entropy production rate. Uh, study it as a function of the rates that you may be able to determine experimentally and use a lot of thermodynamics to say something about it. So lately I'm much more focused on, on the first um, uh, approach, but today I will talk a little bit about the, the second because I think it's more in line with, uh, with this, this session. But to not leave everything in a very really abstract realm for just for physicists, um, let me give you an overview of cellular energetics. Okay, so I don't know, I guess it, I presume there's a lot of people in the audience, but many of them they're not, may not have a good training in, in cell biology, so I think it doesn't hurt to, to go over this. Uh, and the idea is that if you think of a, of a simple microbial cell, something like uh, E. coli, the first layer with the environment, you'll have a set of receptors that may respond to properties such as temperature, or pH, or chemical concentration of different ligands. And um, as these environmental factors change, they fluctuate, these receptors will respond and they will affect uh, internal proteins called response regulators, which typically will consume energy uh, in order to carry out their function. So this energy comes from the hydrolysis of molecules that have already been described, such as ATP. And at the end of this process of signal transduction, or at one stage what happens often is that one of these response regulators will bind to DNA, maybe a transcription factor, it may assemble before binding, and it will result in the expression of a gene. So we can estimate roughly what is the amount of work per unit time per cell that this process, uh, the information processing involves, and you have the number there, it may not tell you too much number, we'll compare it with other numbers. So after the protein has bound to the DNA, what tends to happen, or one of the things that can happen is that a certain gene is first transcribed and then translation translated. Right, so this process again consumes uh, ATP, and uh, this is the process of information copying and amplification. And the amount of ATP that is consumed, particularly in the translation step, is much larger than that information processing. It's actually one of the or the main process of energy consumption within the cell. Finally, these different proteins can do a number of things. One of them could be attaching to a flagella or to the motor of a flagella. And the consequence of this is that this flagella motor will move, thus exerting mechanical work in the surrounding fluid, which will be dissipated into, into heat. Right? Uh, bacteria flagellar motor is driven also by energy, of course, but not by um, ATP hydrolysis, but by a protomotive force. And the, the amount of energy that it actually consumes is significantly larger than the amount of energy involved in a signal transaction, right? but still smaller than that of translation protein expression. And these are sort of very classical systems for physicists to, to, to study or for people working in uh, statistical physics in order to do thermodynamics. But another one that maybe um, um, we're less uh, used to, to, to work with is metabolism. So metabolism is, has already been touched on several times. Um, and it's a, a central process to, to, to the cell which involves energy convert transformations and also mass transformations, right? And, and uh, it tends to end with the synthesis of ATP, whether that's one of its fundamental processes. And in fact, it's a very dissipative process. It's, it, it's a bit hard to estimate, but it comes close to translation. So these are the some fundamental process of the cell. Now we see all of them consume energy. Of course, that's not surprising, and they consume energy in different amounts. And the question then is what thermodynamics can tell us about these different systems, okay? So I'm just going to present a very simple argument, uh, which is sort of epitomizes some work that I did in the past and others as well, and then I'm going to play the role of a kind of evil referee and, and, and criticize it. So the premise that as physicists we, we tend to use is that dissipation is somehow a product of function, right? So in, in, in some sense, this is a trivial statement. Uh, in another sense, uh, we expect it to get informative statements. So let's see how we can go about that. Uh, imagine you have a certain system, um, cellular system. You can parameterize it 
create a model and parameterize it by a set of parameters PI, which can be kinetic rates, can be um, ATP gradient, uh, energy landscape, some stiffness constant. And you expect to be able to estimate from this things like the dissipation of this uh, model of this of the system as well as the function, right? Some biological function of interest. This can be something like the accuracy or the speed or the signal to noise ratio, something that you consider to be biologically uh, desirable. And so then typically you perform a you can perform a parametric perturbation on the ATP driving and what you will see is clearly the dissipation will go up and uh, in a few cases it has been observed that the function improves right? and in some sense uh, the idea here is that uh, dissipation uh, uh, is somehow the cost of cellular function and, and this should clarify um, the role of dissipation in cells right however there, 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 there can be several problems with this line of thinking one of the problems is that dissipation may be suboptimal in some sense right so what i mean by this is that if you have a function that looks something along these lines so let's say monotonically increasing uh, you would expect uh, that uh, the data should fall somewhere in this line right because you're you have a good model you should be able to predict uh, the value of its function as well as the uh, amount of dissipation but often or in some instances, it has been noticed that the data actually falls in these flat regions, right? And what I mean by this is that you could change the amount of dissipation by a big margin and uh, the function wouldn't change, right? And in some sense, this leaves out a large amount of dissipation unexplained, right? So the cause of this is more or less understood. It is just because the ATP hydrolysis in, in a cell, it's around 25 kT, which is very large. Right, so if you add or remove a couple of KTs from there, uh, the reactions are still effectively irreversible. And, and one place where this is, uh, this is found, this type of flatness is in uh, similar transactions and information processing of sensory systems. The second problem um, is that the dissipation curve is typically parameter sensitive, right? So if you have, so okay, so I've been arguing that if you perturb the ATP driving, uh, you would move along this curve. And you may even happen to find a tight bound for the system. However, um, often the, you can tweak all the parameters of your model to lay the, the, the to shift the curve. And what happens then is that it stays unexplained uh, how come if dissipation is such a strong uh, um, evolutionary constraint, didn't the, the data fall uh, on the line? Right? And again, you have this problem of some amount of dissipation that remains unexplained. And the cause of this is, I think, also easy to imagine, essentially, is the idea that the functional space is low dimensional, right? So we can imagine a low dimensional set uh, of, you can call it phenotypic traits, that upon which you expect selection to operate. Uh, but at the same time, the parameter space uh, that you can use to perturb uh, this, this uh, functional space is high dimensional. And so there's a, a lot of room for improvement, and often you will find that, that that's the case. Um, so in some sense, what I'm trying to argue as an evil referee is that for non-metabolic processes at least, uh, there is not a very strong evidence, I would say, that cellular dissipation is being the minimum needed to guarantee function. And so in some sense, this functional explanation of the amount of dissipation in cells uh, leaves some, something open still. And there is a certain amount of non-metabolic cellular dissipation that remains uh, unexplained. Right, so I, I've tried to, 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 to be very explicit about uh, using not the metabolism aside because I think that's a much more complex matter because uh, you, it's not a small subsystem that you can describe. It's a very large coupled subsystem. So what about metabolism, right? I mean, the problem with metabolism is very difficult to, to model. There's many approaches, but, but you know, there's always a lot of unknown um, parameters. Um, but one thing that, that you can do is just try to define macroscopic descriptions of the efficiency of metabolism and that's something that i'm working um, at this stage unfortunately and uh, somehow surprisingly to me there's not a lot of literature in this direction but if you dig uh, deep and uh, old enough you can estimate the metabolic efficiency just based on the consumption rates of, of nutrients of different microbes what you find is that the value of this thermodynamic efficiency is is intermediate right so it's very hard to assess whether metabolism is somehow thermodynamically efficient or, or, or inefficient. By the way, this is very much work in progress on my uh, 
composer in the group, uh, Tommaso Cosetto. And in addition, if, if you read uh, recent literature, literature in the field of metabolic research, particular papers by Matthias Heinemann, which take into account thermodynamics, one of the findings is that um, if you use energy consumption flux balance analysis, the efficiency may actually decrease with dissipation. Okay, so, so instead of uh, things getting better, the more you dissipate, they may actually uh, get worse. Um, so in some sense, uh, there may be an excess of cellular dissipation in cells. In the, in the sense that I mean this is that we do not have a good uh, explanatory theory for it. Okay, And I do not have an answer to this question. I'm just trying to, to a bit provocatively perhaps pose this question and, and many people would feel very comfortable with it, other people may feel uncomfortable with it. So one, some of the possible explanations are that dissipation is simply not something that evolution has optimized significantly. Right? It's just one of the wrong variables. It's just um, been abundant enough and, and it's not been optimized. Another possibility is that it cannot be optimized further without altering some major biological constraint. And so there are things that are very ingrained in cellular systems that is not so easy to change anymore, like, like the genetic code that right, has been talked about today, or like the usage of ATP as a key energy carrier. Another answer to these questions that uh, people have been bringing about lately is that perhaps this excess dissipation actually has a function. Right? So perhaps I mean, one of these examples is that ATP can act uh, as a hydrotope. And the fourth, I'll leave it up to you. So that's all I wanted to say. And Happy to take questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Can I just can I just ask something very briefly? Um, um, sure. So you so you mentioned you know it's sitting not at the optimum in terms of where you reach saturation in terms of the function of interest, the cellular function. So so you're dissipating much more. You have an excess uh, thing. So. Of course, the issue you could say is uh, an issue of robustness, right? I mean, even if you sit, you know, if you sit perfectly, it's a it's a cusp of this curve. In a, say, some uh, you know starvation condition or some fluctuation, and all of a sudden you you fall down in the basement on the left side of the curve. The function completely drops. So it might be essentially a mechanism of robustness. Another uh, a comment I wanted to make is, you know, there could be um, it's about um, let's say ATP concentrations as well, which uses is used for a lot of different things. And the threshold of optimality might be different for the different roles ADP plays. And so it has maybe to, to be an excess of dissipation to make sure that all the different functions work re, um, reliably. So I just wanted to make these comments and see what you how you think about it. And right. So thank you for the for the question. The first question was, uh, as I understood, concerning robustness, right? So I mean that. I think one most of, of, of this is, is um, you know, you find that some data falls in a special point, then you say it's been evolved to be optimal. If you find it falls nowhere, then you say it's robust. Right? So, 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 so the I guess the problem of robustness it doesn't have units, right? <laughs> so, yes, yeah, cer certainly, but but um, there is a large range uh, um, of chemical potentials of ATP in which reactions can still happen similar to the way they happen. Robustness can be an explanation, and that would be a bit in line with saying that perhaps dissipation has just not been significantly optimized. Um, so I, I agree with that. I, it is I do find it a bit difficult to talk about robustness in general, um, like with most interesting concepts in biology, to be frank. Um, the second question was about can can you please repeat it, Robert? It was about uh, if if you talk about dissipation in terms of um, a, a fuel molecule like ADP, which will be used for many different processes. And so the optimum might be at very different places of ADP concentration. Right. So, 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 that's robust. True. so, so, so in, in that sense, that's why I'm trying to look into uh, something like uh, metabolism, right, which is one of the main uh, uh, players or, or translation, right? So I think the first, the first, one important role will be the first look at one of the main players in terms of ATP consumption, and and ribosome is is by far the winner. So for that reason, it's it's hard. I mean. Start to expect, I and mean, one could expect that uh, other subcellular processes which consume orders of magnitude less ATP that have simply not been optimized for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, 
So we don't have any questions coming up from the Q&A, but we still have a few more question minutes of question time specifically for Pablo. So I also wanted to engage some of our other participants in the meeting if anyone else has a question uh, related to this talk beyond Robert's question. I mean, there are quite a lot of questions on the Q&A, but they're quite general and they yeah, might be better for the, for the general discussion. Can I ask a quick question to Pablo? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so thanks for the great talk. It's very interesting. So, so if we look at efficiency from a sort of economics point of view, if we imagine in a society where the, the there's only one currency, there's only one note, a ten pound note, and that's that's how the that we have used that ten pound note. That's the ATP unit. There's only this uh, amount of money that you can use. Then it seems to me is is then when we talk about economic efficiency, we have to view it through this severe constraint of a single uh, amount of uh, coin that you can use. So, so do you think that that that's how we should view efficiency in this cellular context? We have to view it through this to 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 through the lens that there's only ATP. That's that's what thirty ATP. Uh, KBT and that, that that constraints everything, how you spend money and how you construct your machinery in, in the cell. Yeah, so thanks, Chifan. Uh, I guess what you're saying is, given that you're mostly just using one currency, how can you talk about uh, um, optimizing processes, right? So, I mean, one, one um, um, answer to this is similar to what I gave to Robert, right? You could imagine it optimizing the process that most significantly uses that, but it, which I think is a, a translation, so protein synthesis, but uh, it doesn't, I mean, it, the, the steps are Oh, Pablo is coming back. Okay. Maybe we can start the panel discussion now. Yeah, can yeah. we take uh, uh, Pablo's slides down if he's disconnected? All right, so we're, we're going to move next to our panel discussion with all of our speakers from this session. Um, and I can also invite any of our speakers from the other sessions if they want to join and turn on their cameras and participate. Um, so I, I think um, we have a lot of questions actually um, from the audience in the chat um, and I was going to just bring up a sort of a very general question to start because I think it might help us dig into a lot of the concepts that were brought up. Um, so this question um, comes from one of our audience members and the question is to what extent do you think the dissipative adaptation theory explains the trend for complexity in modern Darwinian evolution beyond the initial emergence of life? So how much of life can we explain, I guess, by these thermodynamic principles? Um, so any of our speakers can comment on that it would be wonderful. <clears throat> um, I guess I, I'd be happy to, to, to jump in to begin with and um, say that I, I think that on the one hand, it seems clear to me that what we think of life as being good at is, is a list of different things and they don't necessarily all have to have the same kind of emergence mechanism. It also seems to me like a few different ones that on the one hand seem definable as different behaviors maybe are coming from common sources like emergence of predictive ability isn't the same thing necessarily as emergence of ability to harvest energy um, or uh, isn't necessarily the same thing uh, as let's say the ability to persist and not be beaten to pieces by the, the sort of energy that's flowing through you. But there's a few different things on that list where they start to look like different sides of the same coin, like robustness to the fluctuations of your environment kind of requires being able to predict them and being good at absorbing energy in the ways that you want to from your environment requires being able to perhaps predict it. But then there are other things like self-replication where I wouldn't necessarily say that I see that emerging 
from the same source. So I think from my, in my view or my guess, what we would call the complexity of life as a whole, there may be different mechanisms for different parts of it if we kind of try to look for them to emerge separately. Um, but it may also be that there's kind of a unification if you look at it in the right way. I'm just, I, I wouldn't say that I have necessarily gotten that perspective yet. Jeremy, can I ask a point of clarification on that? When you say mechanistically explaining them, do you mean some kind of explanation from non-equilibrium stochastic thermodynamics, or there might be other mechanistic explanations, and then they all, like, are you specifically keeping that as thermodynamic explanations for everything individually, but not a whole picture, or? Yeah, you... I, th I think that the, the, the story always actually is that there's always a way you can talk about why something happens in a system that doesn't have anything to do with thermodynamics, right? The thermodynamics is kind of a an alternate perspective on many of the same processes, where it, the same way that if you have a polymer and you want to know sort of why the ends are being, you know, pushed apart or pulled together by thermodynamic forces, you can talk about it in terms of free energy and entropy and, and all of that. Or you can think of it more kinetically as being about collisions with molecules in a bath and sort of what forces end up averaging out to. And, and I think in my experience, every time you could have anticipated from making some kind of high altitude thermodynamic argument, what might be possible or likely in a system, there's an alternate explanation that sounds more kind of down to earth that focuses on the particular kinetic rules and the particular kind of physical interactions in that system. Um, so, yeah, I guess what I'm saying mechanism, what I mean more is that in, in, in the least rattling examples that I was presenting where it's sort of a class of active matter systems that are trying to optimize this energy flow uh, property for the system. If you know the system is trying to optimize that, then it becomes a kind of an explanation for what happens the same way that trying to lower free energy can be the explanation for something that happens in an equilibrium system. But you also always can resort to saying, well, what are the real rules of this particular system? You know, why, why would it end up getting in these states and not in those states? And, and you're always going to be able to tell a different kind of story that's more wedded to those particularities. Maybe, can I just, um, a, a related question, I suppose, is, you know, what I, what I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, as I mentioned of uh, Evan Schrodinger, you know, in this book, he mentions, uh, she, 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 he, he raises a question, is there um, a physical theory missing still of the, of the emergence of life? And um, I guess it, my, sort of my question to the panel, and it really so what Jeremy just said, is whether stochastic thermodynamics or the theory of active matter and, and these kind of more modern views, um, are these missing links or is it something more what, what Jeremy just said? It's, you know, this is not the relevant way of, or maybe not the relevant way to think about it. Can, can I step in here? Certainly. Um, I, I think thermodynamics doesn't they'll never tell you everything. I mean, thermodynamics gives you constraints. And what Jeremy just said is, is, is completely correct. So thermodynamics constrains the ratio between a backward and a forward rate between two events. But then the, the, there is still one event or one rate is free. So the ratio is fixed by thermodynamics and thermodynamics will never tell you the kinetics. It just gives you constraints, overall constraints on the kinetics. So I don't think it's a question of, you know, whether thermodynamics will explain or whether kin kinetics will explain. Uh, this is not the alternative. Thermodynamics basically tells you what's forbidden, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what will happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Night, I, I wanted to uh, ask a similar question, make a similar point to, 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 to Jeremy. I mean, I, I suppose one question that people want to understand the answer to is, is emergence of life inevitable? Um, and modulo some boundary conditions, obviously. Uh, or several environmental context. So that, that seems to me something that a thermodynamic understanding definitely should be able to tell us. Do, do, you, do you agree or? I think that um, the, the way that I would, so I, I, first of all, I try to be careful about the distinction between 
the emergence of different lifelike behaviors versus the emergence of full blown life, because I, I do think life is kind of this raft full of different things. And I, I don't think I can make any claim about knowing when and how and why they should all end up getting wrapped together. Like when and how self replicators combine with, you know, uh, modularity combined with prediction combined with robustness and all these different things and, and it has to come together in, in, in one place. It makes sense once it does that it stays that way. Um, but so, so I, I think that that would be the first distinction to make. Then on top of that, I, so I, I, I agree in large part with what Udo just said about thermodynamic setting constraints for things. Um, but, but I also think that what it, what it kind of points to is that um, in some ways what thermodynamics is, is, is a particular subclass of statements you can make about dynamical systems when you you impose certain kinds of rules on relationships between different parts of the, the kinetic uh, rules governing those dynamical systems. And what that points to is that to some degree what you're ultimately going to be able to say about emergence is probably not going to be required to be couched in thermodynamic terms. It just may help to to think in those terms because of where it grounds you. It's I mean I find as a physicist it's just helpful to me to think about things like conservation of energy and it, it gets me oriented. I think about you know balls rolling up and down hills and I have more intuition about that sometimes than I do about other things. But but in in the for example the, the least rattling um, uh, uh, arguments that, that we've been trying to to make lately. It's really fundamentally a dynamical systems argument. What it's saying is that for an arbitrary random Markov graph, you could, uh, I apologize for the noise, for an arbitrary random Markov graph, you, you could um, in principle not have any ability to predict the steady state behavior from a local property uh, in the graph. However, in a large graph, where the edges, the jumping rates on all the edges are taken independently from a random distribution, you can argue that there's a limiting uh, behavior in which the local steady state probability is determined by the local exit rate, which is not generally true, but it becomes true in this limit. Now that limit I just described must be far from thermal equilibrium because in order for the edge jumping rates to be statistically independent, you have to have local breaking of detailed balance. So it's a requirement that it be a non-equilibrium system, but it's not ultimately a theorem, so to speak, of thermodynamics that you have to get emergence. It's more like in a certain class of dynamical system, you're going to get this simplification that gives you predictive power in, in the behavior of the system. Um, and, and that has to happen far from equilibrium. That's the way that I would put it. <clears throat> So there's a, a couple uh, related questions um, in the chat. The, the second one came up at the end of your talk, Pablo. So I'm going to direct this to you first for the panel. Well, actually, I, uh, sorry, sorry, my mic was muted, but could I follow, just follow up that? Before, oh. before? Uh, is it directly related to what Jeremy was saying? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll, we'll go there. So, so just, just, just quickly, um, I want to ask, I want to follow that up, Jeremy, by asking, um, you know, how does the open-ended growth of complexity come into this? Because one of the reasons that, like in the previous session, we were talking a little bit about, you know, things like Girdle and Decidable and, uh, and stuff like that. One of the reasons I started worrying about self-referential dynamics was because when I started making models of, of evolving ecosystems and other people have done this well before me, um, what you always find is that the system evolves to a point and then it stops evolving. And because it basically, you know, maxes out whatever thermodynamic properties are, are, are there and has come to some equi non-equilibrium steady state or something like this. And so then, so then how do you then, you, you, then you never get the open-ended growth complexity. And, and so, you, so we did some, sorry about the background noise, we did some, you know, modeling of that, which I'll talk briefly about tomorrow. But I mean, it seems that that's not something that's easy to describe in a thermodynamic term. Or do you, do you think, do you think one can do that? Jeremy, did you hear the question? Are you able to answer it? Or did we lose Jeremy? Jeremy's muted. Oh. <laughs> Jeremy, you're muted if you're there. Yeah. 
I'm sorry there's a delay, so I click on mute, oh, and then no. I start talking, and it seems like it's unmuted, and, and, and I, or not muted, unmuted, and I click it again, and it gets muted again, so so I apologize, but um, I, I think that I, I would return to the, the thing that Udo mentioned, which is that, so if, you, if you're talking about an arbitrary dynamical system, um, then in terms of going from the kinetic rules to thermodynamic constraints, you at best can set sort of inequalities on what the minimum thermodynamic costs of operating a system like this might be. And then you could always spend more if you want, but there's sort of an underlying minimum. So I think there are some systems where you know the equalities at the edge of those inequalities are being obeyed if they're microscopic and chemical. And when they're more complicated and ecological, the actual you know, uh, kind of macroscopic kinetic properties that you're looking at, they will set bounds on thermodynamics, but they won't automatically tell you about thermodynamics. So I guess we have left, Jeremy. No, I, I'm, I'm here, sorry. Oh, sorry, in, in it's the It's interesting, someone in the meeting muted me, so I, I, I must have lost me at some point. I was, I, 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 am, I apologize, I don't know how much of what I just said got missed, but so I'll, I'll just say briefly, I think in, in anything ecological, the way I would look at it is it's a dynamical system. It might be a dynamical system that where you can argue from purely dynamical arguments that there's some kind of attractor behavior um, that uh, it might settle into. And it may indeed also be the case that you have enough information to connect the dynamics in the system to thermodynamic fluxes that it will appear that there's a thermodynamic principle underlying that. But I think that's not the same thing as knowing from the kinetic description of the dynamics alone what the thermodynamics must be. Because as Udo said before, if you start from the kinetics, you get inequality constraints on the minimum thermodynamic costs of operating something with these dynamics. But for macroscopic systems, those aren't necessarily going to actually be as informative uh, because you're usually operating very far from the thermodynamic limitations anyway. Can I make a quick point on the note of open-ended evolution related to this? I think one of the biggest problems is that none of our theories really account for the his. Like, I mean, I think Jeremy brought up some interesting ideas about work history and things like that. But I think in order to get to a proper picture of open-ended dynamics, it has to be something that's dependent on the history, which Nigel, you know well from you know thinking about self-referential dynamics. But unless you're carrying that history with you, you're not going to be able to get a system that's open-ended. Um, and I, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so uh so they're actually uh, uh i actually dieter i see your hand up now so i'm just getting the video back so go ahead well i have a comment or question for for nigel and jeremy uh you, you know isn't it that evolution has this tendency because it, it explores you know sequence space gets longer at best longer sequences all the time that at the end of the day it will never be able to really get to that steady state in the boundary condition because it can always continue make longer and longer and explore larger sequence spaces. Therefore, it is a little bit difficult to 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 make that closed theory where you hope for that steady state because you don't get there. Or am I missing out the argument? I mean, we probably have tomorrow a better discussion, but yeah. Well, I'll give you a quick answer. Um, Jeremy can give his. I, I don't think that there is a, a fixed point state which is like a dynamical fixed point. I think it's more like a similarity solution of a differential equation, like say the diffusion equation where the, the solution scales as x over the square root of kappa t. It's always the diffusion profile is always going out. Uh, you could say, well, it, 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 eventually it'll be flat, but actually the, what's happening is the intermediate asymptotics is it's always going to be evolving and scaling in some way. So you, so you can think of that as being a, a metaphor, an imperfect one for open-ended growth. And, and just about sequence space, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, there's a work we did about more than 10 years ago where we tried to make a model of evolving um, 
complex objects that that went and looked at what was the genome dynamics that could give open-ended growth of complexity, and we found what it would be in this in this model. And, I, and I, I'll say something about it tomorrow. But it, but the, the bottom line was that what you end up with is not uh, processes like mutation, and so on, but global processes like horizontal gene transfer and gene duplication. Now, in this, now that conclusion happens to be what you see in real biology, but our conclusions were model specific, and in particular, we were modeling the complexity of the genome and the organism in a way that is definitely biologically wrong, just by the length of the sequence. So it relates to your, to your, to your question there, but that's the best thing I can make. Thanks. CS, actually, maybe a read of a question from the Q&A. Um, uh, what would you say is the thermodynamic cost of Maxwell's demon in biology? Is it is this encompassed by the cost of precision that Udo mentioned? So I guess Udo, Udo's um, let's say uncertainty, thermodynamic uncertain relationship. How does it relate to Maxwell's demon? Um, it's not about it's not about the Maxwell demon. I mean, the the Maxwell demon typically uh, is this. LN, the LN2, like Landauer, you get information, you have to store it, you erase it. Uh, the thermodynamic and simple relation is, is, is something quite different. I mean, it's a relation about processes in steady state. I mean, we now have time uh, dependent variations of it, but I don't think it's it's directly or reasonably related to, to the Maxwell Demon issue. I mean, the Maxwell Demon from a thermodynamic perspective is that you do not start in equilibrium, but you have additional information. And that's where you get the work from. And then you have to pay at some other point in order to restore the second law on a more global scale. Um, I also want to take the opportunity uh, to comment briefly on what Dieter just said. Dieter, uh, yes. it, it, it's a wrong impression uh, that we need to have steady states in order to do what, uh, what I showed or what Jeremy showed. So it's just we often use the steady state to illustrate these relations and we have the strongest relations for steady states. But you can certainly have thermodynamics or stochastic thermodynamics in a time dependent environment, for instance, and you can start that was one of my points. You can start with a very special initial distribution concentrated on something and then you see and that uh, ties to what what Nigel said and then you see you know, how it develops and perhaps spreads in, in distribution. Uh, so having a steady state is not a necessary condition for these kind of theories or ideas to apply. Sounds good. Chu Fan, did you have a point? Yes, uh, I, I, I would like to bring uh, Pablo into the discussion. If I understood Jeremy uh, correctly, he was suggesting that macro system is operating so far from sort of stochastic thermodynamics uh, that is, is not even useful. So Pablo seems to be saying at the cellular level is already not useful. Am I am I uh, pushing your, your, your talk too far, Pablo? You're muted. You, you are still muted. Sorry, Pablo. Pablo, you have to unmute yourself. But OK. Am I I'm muted now? So, yeah. yeah what, what I was saying is that I guess that the uh, I don't I don't there's a lack of experiments in this area, right? So so there's there's a I think in general the stochastic thermodynamics, but in particular its application to biology. So in its application to biology, I don't find very strong compelling evidence that I mean it, it, it's self-evident to say that these are lower bounds and sometimes they will be meaningful and sometimes they will be not meaningful. The question is how many instances of them being meaningful um, have we found, right? And, and and I think in what pertains to cellular energetics, that should be a focus. Um, uh, in what pertains to making models, abstract models of, of how evolution may have emerged, I mean, it is true, I agree with what Jeremy was saying, that it is a nice um, clutch if you wish to think about formulating your models in some thermodynamic language, because it, it is useful to think about them that way, but at the same time, um, I also appreciate very much the, the comment from Sarah, right, which probably biology is different. And then if you are too much attached to theories that you know, 
uh, you may not be able to, to, to formulate theories that are um, truly novel and effective to describe the parts of biology that are not just some variant of the known physics, right, which I think is probably the the, the most interesting. Now, of course, I guess like her, I cannot tell you what that theory would. Well, I mean, she, she seems to have some ideas, but <laughs> I don't have very clean ideas of, of what such a theory may be, but um, um, focusing on, on how we can formulate it in very self-consistent and clean depth thermodynamic terms, uh, although it makes us feel a bit more comfortable, may actually not be a productive uh, uh, endeavor, if you wish. So, so may I just follow up very quickly as a, as a quantitative biophysicist? I, 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 it's much better if you tell me at what length scale stochastic thermodynamics is, you can forget about it. So, so, so you say there's not much evidence of uh, worrying about stochastic or energetic cost at the cellular level. Uh, what, uh, uh, how about the other two panel members? Jeremy, do you agree with that? Because you, yeah. you mentioned macroscopic. I don't know what, uh, what, what does it mean? I was going to jump in and say that I didn't mean to give the impression before that I was saying that I think it's not actually useful to, to think in thermodynamic terms. I think it's more that there are systems where the informative description of them is is just a, a dynamical system that isn't rooted in any underlying notion of the thermodynamics and you still can make progress there and some of these ideas you know may still be applicable but i think when you do have grounding in thermodynamics that comes from your understanding of, of the system in question that can be more powerful and, and more predictive um and, and and help you to understand more about what is likely to go on and what can go on. And, and it seems like a natural thing to be wanting to make use of, especially when talking about what's going on with molecules. Um, and I'd also say that I'm not sure that, so, so it, perhaps it might be the case that stochastic thermodynamics, uh, specifically, presumably, if we're, if we're thinking of that as thermal noise, then yes, small things, nano things, care more about thermal noise. Um, but I think that the ideas that come out of this, like what Udo was describing, for example, that there are underlying energetic costs for things like the precise operation of a clock, they do end up having consequences um, on macro scale in, 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 in particular cases, uh, because I think there's still more general reasons why thermodynamic works and the physics that it's connected to that can still end up mattering for some of these questions. So for example, in the in the system I was talking about this mechanical network that was jumping around and exploring its configuration space, um, it, that system actually gives you the interesting behavior um, w without any thermal noise at all, meaning that it, it it is possible, it's a Newtonian system without, you know, if you don't put in some random noise on top of the Newtonian equations you write down for the dynamics, so the fact that you have drag but no noise means you're effectively at zero temperature in a in a in a near zero temperature thermal bath, and it could be a macroscopic system, but then the fact that you're pumping energy into it with a drive dominates its exploration of its configuration space, and now you can have sort of emergent fine tuning properties. So I, I think that the physics that gives you thermodynamics that undergirds the physics of a lot of other systems can still matter in active matter settings where it might not really be the case that you specifically care about, so to speak, the fluctuations of a heat bath. Um, and I think uh, stochastic thermodynamics should be thought of as one formalism and a very powerful and general one, but one formalism among a variety of others which capture the underlying physical principles like time reversal symmetry or, you know, Newton's laws essentially, um, and, and connect as a result um, certain kinds of events in a system to you know, what has to happen in a, in a surrounding heat bath and, and, and things like dissipation. So I, I, I don't think that we entirely can make the division of, well, when things are small, it matters, and when they're not on some scale, it doesn't matter anymore. I think that the, the physics of emergent lifelike fine tuning can apply at various scales and doesn't necessarily need stochasticity. Udo, did you also want to comment on the current discussion? Interesting, nice. I wanted to say something. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
I did, but I think we'll do is talking first. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, I essentially agree with what, what Jeremy was saying. Um, the strongest result we certainly have on the level of, of, of small systems, and the one example I've shown you with this, uh, for this molecular motor, I mean, I think that's really a strong result that we can say 45% efficient at most. And Pablo was pointing, I think, to an important uh, issue. What we do not yet have is, is let's say, good understanding of how, for instance, the thermodynamic uncertainty relation scales with system size. I mean, this is one of the things we are currently exploring in my group, because um, you certainly want a tool which scales with the system. So, you know, if you just look at one degree of freedom or what, if you look at a cell and you just look at, you know, for instance, how its shape changes or so, and you try to infer the dissipation, you typically get something of the order of kBT uh, per second or so. But you want something which scales with the, with the scale of the system, with the size of the system. And I've, we're not there yet. But on a more general level, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic because we know that thermodynamic tells us important, I mean, about steam engines and car engines, and it tells us something important about molecules. So why shouldn't at some point it tell us something important about cells and aggregates of cells? And one more comment on this issue of, of, of efficiency. Um, I mean, if you have efficiency one, you typically have you need infinite time. So if a process sh should happen in a finite time, it's clear that the efficiency cannot be one and there has to be dissipation. So, you know, if a system is only 50% efficient, it may be because it wants to get something done in finite time. Did I cover, did I cover the topics? Yeah, that was great. Um, I was gonna say we we only we're gonna, running short on time, so maybe uh, Nigel, if you have a the point that you wanted to make or question, um, and then we'll wrap up after that. Okay, very quickly, uh, Jeremy, in your dynamical system model with the nodes and the the networks flapping around, did you ever look at what happens if you make a rule that says if the, if there's locally a fluctuation in energy that is above a certain threshold, you add another node to the system with with some springs attached to it, and then watch how that system. Uh, and then do everything that you did before, but with this with this new system, which is now guaranteed to to grow itself over time. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, we, we haven't done any simulations where we uh, allow the network structure to kind of self edit. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's related to a, a different uh, kind of question that one uh, can ask about this, which is what if, for example, you make the input to the system dependent on its behavior in a more sort of comp com computational way or a programmed way? So instead of an environment that has a sort of fixed pattern to it, the environment could be operating a program that depending on what the system does, it could poke it differently. Um, so we, I, I think both of those are very interesting suggestions and I think they could be even more interesting if you combine them uh, because uh, it, it, it's sort of a, on the one hand, very primitive mechanical system, but if you just give it a little bit of a, a nudge out the door in, in giving it the ability to evolve itself, I, I do wonder what kinds of response properties could emerge. But uh, the short answer is we haven't looked at that yet, but I think that's a very yeah, cool idea. I like, the idea of, I like the idea of combining what you were saying with my suggestion, uh, because I think what you will have then is a very primitive version of uh, niche construction, which I'll talk about tomorrow. Excellent. Great, that's a, a perfect segue for us to end um, and get excited about the conversations tomorrow. So I wanna thank all of our speakers today um, and everyone for participating in the discussion and also our audience. And we'll see everyone again tomorrow for our first session on the emergence of order. Thank you all. Bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye.